Catherine, would, would you like to start recording now? Um, and we'll make a start. So welcome everybody. Um, I must admit, I didn't um, expect this um, workshop to go viral like it has. Um, so it's certainly we've probably got something like 240 um, delegates now uh, listening in. So uh, more than more than we could have we could have expected, but, but more the merrier really. So um, uh, that's absolutely fine, but it's just taken a, a bit longer to get everybody um, logged in. Uh, just a bit on housekeeping. I think most people have gone on mute, um, but if please, if you're not um, if you're not a speaker and you're not me, um, please go on mute um, and also um, turn off your cameras, please. Um, so the only people using the, the camera and, and voice will be the presenters and, and myself at the moment. Um, if you have questions, um, please use the, the chat box. And we will have a session right after all the presentations where we'll have a session of uh, taking questions for all the speakers. The expectation being that we can group some of the right. questions into uh, into 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 relevant uh, topics. I've got an echo, so I'm wondering if somebody's not on mute. OK. Right. So here we are. So this is our first of, of possibly um, several workshops um, introducing the subject of pipeline flanges. Uh, the reason why we've picked this subject is because um, well, I'll start off with um, what flanges are all about. So flange joints are one of several methods of pipe jointing used in the water industry. This workshop is predominantly about the water industry. However, there are very uh, similar um, lessons to be learned, possibly with technologies um, in the gas industry. So possibly there are uh, lessons learned from the gas industry that we could also use, but it's primarily, primarily about pipeline flanges in the water industry. So pipeline pipe flanges are used in places where piping, instruments, valves, equipment, etc., are required to dismantle, be dismantled for maintenance. A flange joint is an assembly of three different components, and you'll see this as the various speakers um, introduce themselves. But uh, there will be flanges, gaskets and bolting. However, there's the reason why we're having this workshop is there's growing concern across the industry about the frequent occurrence of failures on flange pipes. The causes are many and include incorrect specification, poor design of pipeline arrangements, inadequate support, defects in manufacturing and bad workmanship in construction. Um, as we many of us have found in many cases, the causes of failure is not easy to determine and may involve several factors. In ductile iron pipes, for example, regardless of the cause and effect, the effect is always the same where the flange hub becomes detached from the pipe. However, all flange joints are subject to failure. And if the likely forces that they are subjected to are not understood, there is likely to result in, in a failure, sometimes catastrophic. This situation is not helped by the common misconception in the industry that flanges are immensely strong. They certainly look substantial, being made of heavy grade metal with prominent thick weld at the end of the flange hub. In today's workshop, the girl has tried to pull, to pull together a good cross-section of the pipeline industry's experts to look at developing technical information discussion on pipe flange failures and contributing factors. So on my slide now, so I'm Richard Weeks. I'm chair of the utilities panel of the Pipeline Guild. There are other panels and there are other regional groups as well. Um, but this is so this is just one section of the Pipeline Guild. Um, before we start, um, I would like to just mention we normally have a safety moment um, on, on, on presentations and just to sort of emphasize the seriousness of the subject that we're going to talk about today because when there are failures in water mains and particularly under high pressure but sometimes under quite moderate pressures when there are failures the effect can be quite catastrophic um, not only for for the pipeline which uh, which can completely rupture but also for any personnel that are in close proximity to the burst. 
So this is not a matter to be taken lightly. So flat failures in any pipe, and particularly phalanges, can result in serious injury or, or even death. So that's my safety moment. So that is why we're taking it seriously. It's important to understand this phenomenon and not, uh, not be complacent. So um, I've mentioned um, the, the one feature we'll have, we'll have all the questions at the end if you, if you don't mind. So keep posting questions as we go um, and they won't, then they won't get forgotten. And then we'll try and group them and have a, a question and answer session at the end. And then there will be a bit of a wrap up from me and um, and then our CEO Norman Howell will, will just mention um, future pipeline events. Uh, after that, the recording will be closed. Uh, so that will be the end of the formal workshop. If anybody feels mindful to stay in online, we're not going to close the platform down. We're going to leave it open a bit like going to the bar after a, a, a live pick event. Um, this will be an informal chat afterwards for people to to chat away and ask questions, but it won't won't be recorded and there's no obligation to stay. So that said, I'm going to start um, the presentations now. And the first one is by uh, Nick Preston, um, so an experienced water engineer, um, 35 years experience in the business, working for UU, a lot of experience with flanges and flange failures. And he's also um, uh, a chair of the um, Standards Committee for Europe as well on water supply. So at this point, I'll hand over to Nick. Thank you, Richard, for that uh, useful introduction. If I've got this right, at some point or other, this should come up on your screen. Oh, you want that? There we are. Is that looking at like a, a horrible picture of a, the at the Institution of Civil Engineers, a rather large valve on a rather small head? It occurred to me when I was doing this, and, and you put that together, Richard. Thank you very much. Is that yeah? Actually, I've been in the utilities sector for the last thirty-five years, but I started my career in the nuclear industry some forty odd years ago doing exactly this, looking at pipes and and flanges in particular. Uh, a couple of nuclear power stations are still going with some of my pipes in them. And more recently, by some sort of quirk of COVID, I suppose, I spent a significant amount of my time in the last couple of years looking at pipes and flanges and pipe materials in the pharmaceuticals uh, and food and uh, chemical sectors. That's a uh, picture of some horrible flanges. So if this works, I'm going to give you at no more than 10 minutes, which is a very, very, very fast run through of all the different forces that go into a flange, how those forces convert into some sort of stress and strain, and why as both designers detailing pipe flanges, you know, procurement looking at where they're going to buy them from, as well as obviously the guys in the field bolting them up during commissioning need to look at all of those forces because at the end of the day, as Richard said, they're supposed to be there so that we can dismantle them at some point in the future. That may not be the very near future. And the most obvious one is tension. So the pipes are trying to pull apart and it's just worth getting your heads around right from the very beginning that something as simple as an NP16 or PN16, if you have to speak European, is actually going to be tested, let alone designed, tested to pull apart at 24 bar. So just start having a think about how that pulls apart, because it's quite important to understand it. Other speakers are going to go through lots of things to do with BSs and ENs and DINs and bolts and gaskets. I won't cover that now, but just bear in mind it is the bolt and the, the bolts the two flanges together and it's the gasket that keeps the water in or in some cases the shite out. So every time you've got a closed valve, even a test end plate during commissioning, a bend, a taper, there is a tensile stress across the flange. And it's not so easy to, to think that actually there's an impact load. And in my experience of flange failures, it's quite often that someone down the chain 
uh, the supply chain from design all the way through to, to commissioning hadn't fully thought about what would happen in terms of an impact load uh, as something such as an air valve closing. Other pressure considerations that result in these stands are also to do with polyethylene pipes. So polyethylene pipes, when they are pressurised, get bigger in diameter, they creep, which creates a tensile force. Um, let alone that, some valves are bolted onto flanges, which are bolted onto pipes, which actually have a dissimilar material, they have a different dissimilar diameter, and all of those exert a different type of tensile stress across, across the, the flange. We here in the UK do get some seismic events, but the guys, colleagues in New Zealand, when they've been looking at this, um, their failures of flanges were often caused during um, their, their earthquake events because the designer and the constructor together hadn't thought about exactly how these forces work across the flange. Bolts numbers we talked about, sizes, you know, I don't need to be able to go into that in 10 minutes, there are other speakers coming up. My, my key point is the requirements under anything to do with the, the Guild are, there's a fantastic realm of people out there, the Pipeline Utilities Panel um, has got experts on it and we're going to hear later from Craig. So if in doubt, ask Craig. Bear in mind you've got the pipes that could move up and down. They tend not to move up and down during construction. There is enough tolerance in the bolt and hole to be able to get them together. But bear in mind these are going to be dismantled. Um, so you know, make sure your pipe bridges, um, the support mechanisms you've got are all in place to ensure that the forces across the flange, the movement, the shear stresses, aren't going to be high because they will result in strain. And it's strain that we don't want to see anything of in our flanges. Ask someone, ask Phil Kleshen, ask Dupanka, just, you know, ask Phil Green, you know, just how is it you go about designing to overcome this? Because we're here, we're here to help you. Another one is, is bending, a uh, bit of a graphics complexity about how you cope with a, a flange itself that's bending. Uh, these happen quite often. They, they are often the cause of the flange failure that we actually see in the field, not necessarily because either the designer or the, the installer has misunderstood it, but they are an opportunity for very high stresses and very high strains across the flange when actually the bolts themselves, bolts are very strong, uh, but they do tend to elongate slightly and Craig will explain about how the gasket will then leak or not. I've ignored torsion because I can't do that in 3D in, in PowerPoint. So always check all of the guidance that's available to you. Um, the manufacturers produce lots of, there are lots of documentation. There are lots of design standards out there. Make sure you've referred to them. And you know, if not, ask Phil Clisham, ask Phil Green. They will help you. Um, that's what we're here for. Uh, just bear in mind that there are no forces across the buried flange. There are no stresses across the buried flange and there are no strains against a buried flange because there aren't any buried flanges, are there? Hand on heart. Uh, Civil engineering specification of the water industry says we, says don't bury them. However, uh, I know I'm not daft. We do have to bury flanges at times. So when you do, please, please make sure that the, that the valve, the hydrant, the PRV or whatever it is that's going to be bolted up to this flange uh, has been you know, put in a chamber of an appropriate design, that there's proper foundation support, you know, use things like rocking of pipes and flange adapters and so on. So as we bans it, BSEN 14801 actually allows it under certain conditions. And to Panker in a few minutes or less, if I've gone over time, uh, we'll be telling you more and more about burying flanges. Just bear in mind, I haven't touched at all today, but we will in future if you want us to on the utilities panel, talk about unprotected or inappropriate protected bolts, washers and nuts, because there isn't necessarily a, a force against those uh, over the long term due to burying. So in summary, flanges correctly designed and correctly installed 
work very well to join pipes to their relevant fittings. Once everyone's considered during the supply chain process, all of the loads, all of the loads, and all of those stresses and strains that then, then flanges shouldn't be a problem. You know, they work well. Bear in mind that construction design management regulations, 2015, requires a competent person, whether that's in the design uh, or in the contractor, uh, to be competent. And therefore, if you don't know what you're doing, then the thing to do is ask. Do not be the weakest link as a person because the flange shouldn't be the weakest link uh, if properly designed, properly installed. So you might be the weakest link. Just don't expect me to come and bail you out when the time comes because he was never the best really host of uh, who wants to be a millionaire, but at least he did get the message across. Ask the panel, ask the utilities panel, phone a friend, yeah, there's plenty of them here. Yeah, please, please just ask. Um, by all means, ask me, ask any other member of the utilities panel. We're here to help you. I hopefully will answer any further questions in due course and Richard will now take back control. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, that was interesting presentation and good introduction to um, what is um, about to to follow you you, you will get that you, you've got the start of some reoccurring themes so some of the things that uh, Nick introduced uh, like um, don't bury flanges but if you do have to um, make sure that the, the the forces on the flanges are well understood and the flanges are protected that theme of, of understanding where your forces are on flanges is going to reoccur right through um, this this workshop. So, um, oh, one thing I didn't mention is that well, I did mention that this is the first of several workshops on on pipe flanges and pipe jointing generally. In the um, chat box, if as well as having questions to the presenters, if you would like to suggest ideas for future events, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll pick them up as well. So that was Nick under, um, about understanding where your forces are. Um, as a, any engineer should know where, where their forces are acting and know how to protect them. Um, Dipanka, our next speaker, is going to focus on the effects of ground conditions and where, you know, where the very place you shouldn't be burying flanges, but actually because we know we have to. Uh, once we're going to bury pipelines, we need to understand things. And one of the major uh, problems with flanges is, is, is varying ground conditions and movement of ground. And Dupanka is going to cover that point. So for those of you that don't know Dupanka, is a well-known um, engineer in, in the industry, 25 years experience across the whole section of um, water engineering, including manufacturing as well, which um, not everyone has got that exposure, but so um, certainly got a lot of int a lot of experience in pipelines and major pipelines as well. Um, so at this point, um, I would like to hand you over to Dupanka, who will take control and do his presentation. All right, Ed. Everyone, Alan, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Has it come up? Yeah, that's fine. You're OK to go. Not in presentation mode, Banker. Yeah. I think there is a problem. Hang on, just just give me one second. Now it should be OK. OK, can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, yes, yeah. thanks. You're okay. good to go. Yeah. Right, yeah, thanks. Uh, a little bit of a hiccup. So um, I think my task is to um, talk about the effect of ground um, on pipeline, particularly focused on flanges. So Nick has um, given some 
very uh, initial ideas and then i will uh, also discuss about some of the concepts some of the reasons why um, this could be a problem uh, what are the mitigation measures and uh, then uh, go through some of the cases so um, the first one is um, we many of us probably are well aware of the structural design of pipes, um, particularly uh, cross-sectional design, which is BSCN 1295 and 9295. There is a very good talk uh, via PIG uh, carried out by Phil Clisham some time back, available on YouTube, on which goes into, um, covers a lot of detail about structural design, so I won't really go into that. But what is important is to know that the codes actually well, don't I'm deal in with through my phone connection. So if you go on your Wi-Fi, this sorry, sorry, um, can you go on mute, please? Thank you. Okay. And um, so uh, what I was saying is the most important part to note is that structural design or cross-sectional design don't actually deal with 3D effects or longitudinal bending, which is almost inevitable in, in a pipe buried in ground. So that's the message from this slide. Um, um, so this is, we'll, we'll now talk about the uh, important aspects uh, about the ground uh, and how it affects. So a pipeline is a geotechnical structure. The only uh, big difference with a standard foundation is it's a flexible structure. It has got enormous capacity to take movements. Um, um, but it is, it, is a, it is a structure which responds to ground conditions. Uh, and that's where the very most critical complexity arises. Because um, in order to put a pipeline in the ground, uh, we have to acknowledge that the, the ground will move or, um, and the pipe has to adjust. And movement in ground depends on various things. It can be just settlement, it can be um, long time movement of fines, uh, water change in water table. So an assessment of the ground condition is must. Um, and generally the advice would be to seek specialist uh, sort of inputs from geotechnical engineers. Um, just for understanding, I have listed out some of the key aspects like the type of soil. Is it a granular soil, uh, cohesionless sand, gravel, RTG, river terrace, gravel type soils? Is it fines? Is it means clay, silt, or is it mixed or organic, which is the worst of the lot? Um, native soil stiffness is perhaps more, more relevant for cross-sectional design, which is the Sprangler modular stiffness. Structural strength is bearing capacity and other aspects. Uh, the extent of consolidation of the soil is important because it governs how much settlement will happen or can happen. Permeability of the uh, soil, that's a natural characteristics, like it's quite low in clays, uh, considerably higher in granular soils, presence of water table. All these things are then put together to come up with an assessment of the settlement that can happen along the pipeline. Um, the graph on the right hand side, it's it's a PSD Emma, graph, part, particle size distribution well, graph. presentation that's live, will that still work? That's Phil. Because that's off the network. Uh, hi Phil, would you mind just going on mute? That's okay. Okay, so the top one is a particle size distribution graph. Um, and all it does is it sort of qualifies what's the material type. Is it in fines less than 63 microns or more than four millimeter? So that's what it gives a good understanding of the type of soil. The bottom one is from a is from a project, 16 or 18 kilometer long pipeline, very large diameter. And uh, this is how the settlement uh, characteristics were plotted. And the ones on the shaded areas are where the settlement, predicted settlement of the ground is likely to exceed the capability of the pipe. So this is how you have, you have to approach 
uh, and you then start designing those areas in a way that it can be dealt with the settlement. So um, this is this is just for an example. Um, more complex conditions like uh, seismic, uh, peak ground acceleration, peak ground velocity, liquefaction. Did actually not in this afternoon. Uh, these are all uh, have to be reviewed if there is a potential for liquefaction or seismic conditions. Um, I think one question we often get asked is um, if it's a trenched pipeline, why would it actually undergo movements now? Um, and how much big, how big is the movement now? I think that the, the reason why um, this question comes is understandable because many cases uh, we just do 2D cross sectional design. We never think about the longitudinal effects. I think it is important to understand how how the settlement happens. So if a pipe is to be installed at say three meters below ground level or one and a half meters, so the invert of the pipe is roughly around three meter. As soon as the ground is dewatered and excavated, the ground will heave. Depending on the type of ground, if it's gravel, the heave can be quite quick and small. If it is clay, it is different. The ground heaves and then once the pipe and the backfill and the embankment etc all filled and back compacted back it gradually moves so this movement is inevitable it cannot be stopped and if it does happen the pipe has to have the flexibility to accommodate that generally this movement is tiny it's almost uh, very small and the natural flexibility of either a ductile or a socketed joint or a steel or a HDP pipe is far more than this requirement. So it never is an issue. But it does become an issue in soils where the settlements can be quite high. For example, in some clays where um, a test, once the test is done, the primary settlement and the secondary settlement or creep can amount to 100 millimeter or more. Or for example, in organic soils, it can be uh, it can be quite disastrous uh, for a pipe if it sees or it is exposed to settlements of 300 millimeter. So I think it's the importance of understanding ground movement is the most critical one. The the, the schematic on the top is an odometer used for uh, settlement analysis in clays. Um, the one on the bottom is a settlement uh, graph prediction graph. Uh, but these are core geotechnical subjects and I have just borrowed from one of my friends, but I do. I think many of us will understand the uh, the main uh, crux of this thing, why it is important. Uh, how do we manage settlement? The, I think there are two very dominant methods of doing this. One is uh, use a rocker pipe, which is nothing but uh, two couplings or flange adapters uh, or socket joints and a spigot pipe or a barrel pipe between the two. Um, this is what we use in water industry to a large extent. And uh, and, and it's, it's quite simple. It doesn't, I think the most important message is this method, method doesn't really add any more load to the pipe. Uh, and the method of calculating the rocker uh, length is here. There are some recommendations and that's how it looks like um, the top one. Uh, so it's it's quite fairly simple and there are lots of uh, guidance on this thing. I would spend a little bit more time on settlement due to or, or how to manage settlement when a pipe is going to be bent. OK, I think the most important thing is um, this is the method used for continuous pipes, that means HDP and steel pipes. Um, the objective is to allow the pipe to bend along with the curvature of the ground. But what we must understand is still or any in the water sector, we normally deal with very flexible pipes. They are easy to bend, but at the same, same time, they change or deform in cross section. So the bending has to be controlled. Otherwise, it can lead to very disastrous form of uh, problems for a pipe. The other key message is uh, I did a quick uh, method of calculation. So sigma is the bending stress and it's a function of the Young's modulus of the pipe depending on. So if a pipe, if a steel pipe is exposed to a settlement, 
it will generate a lot more bending stresses than what a HDP pipe will do because just the material is softer in HDP. So this is very important because if you are connecting a steel pipe on a flange, the chances that the bending stresses will be quite high <coughs> with the same degree of settlement. The, um, these are two schematics or pipe soil interaction um, models. And its main, main highlight point is that um, any fittings, joints, bends, uh, they tend to accrue <coughs> a lot more stresses than what a straight pipe will do. The photos in the bottom are uh, long sea outfall photos. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and these are just to show the natural flexibility of the pipe. Um, so buried pipe flanges. How has that is, previous equation been derived? Um, which equation? The this one. I can answer this later on. So if you, if uh, you could put, yeah. yeah so if you put your question in the chat box, um, we can pick it up afterwards. Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, when when a buried pipe flange is exposed um, to bending. What happens? So we, I think there are there will be a lot more discussion on the bending in flanges. But what happens in essence is that a part of the flange goes into tension, the other one can go into compression, uh, depending on the position of the neutral axis, and this changes the pattern of stress and strain on the bolts to an extent. This can lead to differential compression on gaskets, and then that could eventually lead to failure so or even form of uh, leakage so it's important to understand what happens when a flange is put under bending um, this is the more common form of equation sigma m by i times z that's how uh, the section modulus uh, is calculated i being the section modulus now although a flange looks very robust but if you think about the same principle, like uh, half of it might go in, new, in tension, uh, the other part in compression. Its section modulus could could be quite low. In very large diameters, it's actually almost half of that of the pipe uh, of a of a of a certain d by two ratio of certain thickness. So that's very important because um, it, it it is going to be in realistic scale. It is going to be somewhere between the low and the high figures, but it's difficult to predict. When it is put under bending, it's just not predictable how it is going to be. And it's just because it has got several bolts which are not tied together. They don't act in tandem together. What's another important thing is to understand that many materials don't have the same problems or they have much bigger problems. GRP, GRE or uh, fiber composite materials, they are not actually designed to take bending. So that's important. The failure modes in steel and ductile iron are also very different flanges. A steel pipe or a HDP pipe flange generally fails in leakage or pulling out, whereas a ductile iron, it could lead to a structural failure, means the flange completely disconnecting. So it can lead to very quick and rapid failure. So, so there are different modes of failure. Um, and um, if we really have a situation where we have to Put a flange in buried like a valve. Consider providing a proper plinth support. Uh, you, you should not consciously. We should try to avoid any form of um, bending on the flanges. It's just not predictable. I think that's pretty much it. Just the key messages: uh, composite, buried pipes are geotechnical structures. Ground is heterogeneous. If it moves, pipe moves. We cannot design a pipe to stop movement. Uh, restricting movement these pipes is not an option. Accommodating movement is much easier to design. Uh, flanges are rigid connections, not fit for use for where movements are expected, and that's pretty much it. I think. Okay, thank you, Topanka. That's it. Thank you. Um, okay, there was a lot, lot to take in there. Um, very uh, technical, interesting presentation. Um, just to reassure everyone, not to panic. Um, copying down things because the presentation will be available after the workshop 
along with the, with the recording. So there's no need to uh, to, to to frantically take notes. Um, there was a lot in that, uh, particularly with, with ground movements. And one of the things I, I you know, is, it might be useful to take away is that even if, if you do have buried flange arrays, um, note on some of those drawings, there was a reinforced concrete slab underneath the whole thing. So though the pipework wasn't in a chamber, it was in half a chamber at least, and and that's what's taking the um, the strain that's, off. That's correct. The flanges. All all big plinths, uh, 350, yeah. 400 thick plinths. Yeah. So um, again, a lot there, and you should start to get a theme now running through these presentations of do's and don'ts with um, with flange pipe work. Okay, um, that brings us quite nicely now onto the next uh, presenter. Uh, Phil Clisson. Now, I I don't have the same notes for Phil, but arguably I don't need to because uh, Phil's very well known in the industry, <laughs> and uh, most people will have will have heard of Phil, and um, he's also a very knowledgeable person actually um, in the whole spectrum of of, of the world of pipelines. Um, he's worked in and consultancy, and is now an independent, but um, all over the place in terms of the world of pipelines. Um, so at this point now, I'd like to hand over to Phil to take control and uh, give his presentation on some of the construct. So when the design, what well, some of the things designers should be thinking about um, on how these pipelines will be constructed. Okay, Richard, is the um, is, is the presentation slide come up? It has, but not in presentation mode yet. It's... That should work. Yeah, that's it. Right. Well. Thanks for that, Richard. I, I, I don't feel very knowledgeable. I've got to admit, I seem to, to learn more every day now than, than I ever have. So that there's a lot to know. Well, I was and going to say that um, you thought you might know more than I do, but I thought better of it, Phil. So <laughs> <laughs> it's um, yeah, well, well, there seems to be an awful lot to know. And um, so I, I've been tasked in 10 minutes with certainly talking about um, pipe work detailing. Now for me, pipe work detailing is an art that takes years to master and it, it's not, not very well recognised, but I will try to introduce some of the, 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 the key, if you like, principles that sit behind it and hopefully give some sort of an appreciation. I'll talk about some of the causes of flange failures and, and, and why, why they're there that I see commonly. Um, so, okay, as we've already said, I'm going to be reinforcing a lot of the same points that, that Richard has made. Um, flanges do sometimes fail. The larger diameter pipes are certainly less forgiving than the smaller diameter pipes. Um, the cause of the failure can be due to poor installation and often is, but it, equally it's often due to poor design. Now some of the later speakers are going to be talking about the installation aspects and I'm going to be talking more about the design aspects. As I've already said, the pipe work detailing for me is an art and a good pipe work detailer can make everybody's life so much easier. And Two details can look the same and one can be very easy to construct and go in beautifully and another one can be a nightmare for everybody involved. Um, so key different joint pipe jointed systems, as, as most of you will know, we've got spigot and socket joints. These um, primarily buried joints and accommodate ground movement, as Dipankara said. You've got welded joints, but these are on systems. These are not joints that are, uh, can, uh, can move so much, uh, but they, they only get used on polyethylene and steel piss systems where the steel or the polyethylene can accommodate the ground movement so they can be used buried. What you can't do with either of these is remove pieces of apparatus like flow meters, valves, or, and they can be difficult to assemble if you've got a tie in between two pieces of pipe. So we're forced to sometimes bury flanges, but flanges as a system are primarily designed as above ground pipes and all the tests are set up as if they're above ground pipes. And so if we're going to put them below ground, we've got to be very, very careful that we don't overload them. Um, the other group are the, the couplers and the flange adapters, which are essential items, especially when it comes to dismantling and taking out valves and, and other pieces of apparatus in, in the future. Um, as we already touched on, as I'm sure Craig will follow on as well, we make life difficult for ourselves in the water industry because we've got the existing network, which we like to tie into and like to, to work with which had valves and flanges going back um, 150 years. And we also put in a lot of ductile iron and polyethylene and other materials, which are very, very different. 
and these all ask a lot of the flanges and the you know the, the, these combinations um, can be quite demanding and we have on the photograph here you've got polyethylene going into steel going into ductile iron all really quite different materials and um, you know the polyethylene is a much thicker wall which we'll touch on compared to the ductile iron which causes more complications and has to be considered so how do flanges work well nick's already covered this as richard and others have i'll i'll, I'll give a slightly different take on it and and the way i think about it in a more in, in my sort of way as I've already pointed out they look like awfully robust things the big thick chunky lumps of metal with big thick chunky bolts and and I've seen many knowledgeable people suggest that they're the strongest parts of the pipe and it's simply not the case. What a flange is about is a compression a very thin gasket. So there's your gasket, it's about three millimetres thick typically and it, when it's compressed it compresses by a fraction of a millimetre. Um, you've got flat faces and, and it needs that fraction of a millimetre compression in order to form a seal. So the, the, the the problem is, is any kind of strain and that, that gasket is no longer compressed. So if the flanges bend or twist or if the bolts stretch, then then you're going to have problems and you're going to have leaks and the leaks grow. Um, what we have here is bolts that were overloaded because there's a moment on, on this flange. They're both casting flanges, so the flanges are, are quite robust. So the, the bolts are stretched in this case and the gasket blew out and then progressively carved a slot in the um, flange face which made the the burst worse and worse so flange design is all about limiting that strain as de Pank has pointed out very often if you've got a bending moment there's only a few bolts in tension the rest of them are not doing anything and if they stretch by more than a little bit then you're going to get a leak and you're going to get problems and um, progressive uh, worse failures um, so it really is important the flanges keep that tight together and when you tighten them up, it's, it's really important that all the tension from the bolts and the bolts are set and the right grades that it goes into the gasket and, and gets those conditions just right. And that's not overloaded. And so actually, it's probably one of the most sensitive joints that we use of all in the pipeline industry and that has got to be treated with care as a result. Um, Phil Green will go through, through this in more detail in his talk, but <clears throat> it's important to appreciate that the, the for ductile line systems amongst others the the flange pipe systems the expectation is they'll be used above ground and the type yeah, testing for fantastic. them is um simply span them over four meters um have a joint in the middle and pressurize it with a small moment so mm -hmm. which, which equates to the if, if whoever's on mute could could go on mute that'd be great um if we could mm -hmm. so effectively you're a 12 meter span with the weight of the pipe with no ground at all on it and if it holds that for two hours it's passed its test and that's about all the load that they, they typically are normally allowed uh, are able to take stub flanges on polyethylene systems are even more complex and more challenging and um, polyethylene is a very different material it creeps which means you tend to lose the tension on your bolts <clears throat> and you've got to be very careful that if because the, the pipe walls are different diameters, you can end up with really quite a short area where the, the gasket's got to seat and seal. And so getting compatible flange um, pipe um, and polyethylene stub flange arrangements is, is tricky. And you really have to sometimes draw them out to scale, particularly for the larger diameter, thicker wall polyethylenes. Um, Something we see quite a lot of is polyethylene tends to just be bent in stay in, into to, to shape. It is quite flexible, but this joint leaked. It leaked on the bottom. And that's because the guys tried to bring the faces together on the bolts and thought they'd achieved it, but they haven't quite. They really has to have proper compression on those on that face. And so this needed dismantling and the pipe relaying and, and remaking and then and it's worked and has worked fine since. So the whole installation, you, you, you've got to be careful that you, you bring them together nice and squarely. They, they're intended to be above ground joints and not take big bending moments. There you go, that's showing the curve on the actual pipe and, and why there was a problem. So common design flaws that cause flanges to fail, in my experience. There are a number of others, but these are the common ones. Too many rigid flanges bolted together, then buried. 
And if you haven't got that concrete slab, as Richard mentioned, and Dipanka mentioned underneath to take out the ground movements, then the ground movements cause failures. In this case, this, this system failed quite early on, um, but they, they, they can fail over time as well. Differential settlement, as Dipanka always said, is a common cause of problems. You tend to have a valve chamber, a pumping station, or a, a tunnel shaft with a flange on top. And unless you have the ability to, to you know, manage the fact that the shaft's going to settle differently to the ground outside, then you, you're going to overstress that flange if you're not careful. I want to talk, want to talk a little bit about today, which is probably the most troublesome um, and the most I get called in to deal with is um, when when there's been a failure to recognise implications of testing and disinfection and how these things have to be assembled. And what happens typically on a large pipeline projects or even some small ones is that the contractors have won the job and they want to get on with it. They, they recognise the fact that valves and, and big T's and fittings are on long leading times and they want to get them detailed up and ordered as quickly as possible. So the designers are under huge pressure to, to knock out drawings in full detail and schedule all the fittings so they can be ordered. The contractors in the meantime get on with laying as soon as they possibly can. Now this is sometimes before proper trials are done. You don't even know the, the, the detailed orientation of some of the pipes you have to connect to. And neither party has, has really worked out how the main's going to be cleaned, pressure tested and disinfected because that, that's months away. But then within a few weeks it needs to be worked out and um, what you have then is a very compromised position where you have to try and make something work with what you've got. And this is the cause of so many problems because that thought hadn't been given to the original detail. It was as if it was wished into place and you've got to get to that point. So it, it's difficult because designers uh, you know, are not construction experts and contractors are not design experts. And so we have to work together and it, it can get quite fractious and so you know there has to be a starter for 10 and then it has to be developed exactly how you're going to put this thing together and test it and disinfect it and then then do a tie-in within a, a few hours quite often now we've got some examples of test ends here which, which have been thought through so you know pieces of pipe could be dropped back in and and the the ends were already restrained by the permanent works and there's, there's drawings with sequencing, so telling the contractor what they're going to do at which stage. If you get this right, really quite complex tie-ins in tight can, can go very smoothly, but it, it can be fractious and difficult and challenging to get there. Um, but it, it's something that seems to fall between design responsibilities, temporary works perceptions and, and contractors perception of what design is. And um, it, it's something that I would encourage both sides to work together on. So just to summarise, I can only do so much in 10 minutes, but flanges are really intended for use above ground. Um, the limitations should be recognised when detailing below ground, and, and that will come up loudly across in every presentation probably today. Um, they're not as strong as many perceive them to be, and ideally the pipe work detailing should reflect the installation sequence. And, and Contractors and consultants really do need to invest time in getting the details and sequency right. The the devil is in the detail. So hopefully that's 11 minutes. I'll take it, Richard. I hope that's OK. That's uh, absolutely fine. Thanks, Phil. That's um, we're pretty much on on schedule. I hope um, everyone found that fascinating. I certainly did. And I like I like the fact that um, pipe, pipeline engineering is an art. Uh, yes, <laughs> but it's also it's also a science and it's also engineering and not just ordinary engineering. It's precision engineering really um, in the world of flanges. So. Um, yeah, a lot to think about there, um, but again, reoccurring themes about understanding what's going on with with pipeline arrays and particularly with flanges, making sure that effectively you've thought of everything. Um, because if you don't think of everything, um, including construction, including operation, chances are something will happen. Right, I'll just see if I can go. Can you see my screen? I'm not sure you can. Yep. You can see the welcome. Welcome one, right, okay, good. So, yeah, so um, now we're going to, we, we, we're starting to get a theme now that um, 
of the main materials in, in water pipes um, being ductile iron, steel and, and the plastics, uh, predominantly uh, polyethylene. Um, so the next um, presentation um, by Neil Millwood is on is one of two presentations on one on steel and then the second one by Phil Green on ductile iron to give you an introduction as to how uh, flanges or flange pipes are made. And it's interesting that whilst they probably look very similar when they arrive on site, when they're all painted and welded, um, the techniques used for attaching flanges to pipes is, is very different. And I think it's important to understand those differences, uh, particularly for, well, for designers and contractors really, to understand the differences between steel flanges and ductile flanges. Um, so, you know, we make the appropriate allowances for what, what uh, forces they can take. So at this point, I will start to hand you over now to, to Neil Millwood, who's an experienced, very knowledgeable person in welding, uh, both in the gas industry and also in general industry, um, right, Rolls-Royce submarines, that sounds pretty exacting to me um, to understand the forces there. So. Um, very experienced person in the industry in the world of welding. So at this point, I'll hand you over to, to Neil. So I'm just going to share my screen. Just bear with me a second. Richard, if you can uh, unshare your screen. OK, you should have. If you click share content. Yes, yeah, it's, it's giving me that infernal uh, eternal circle. Uh, bear with me a second. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be playing ball at the moment. Is there a plan B? Richard, could you do it and we just say move on? I'm Eight just looking points. for, we could switch the order um, or you could, I could try and open up um, your presentation and we could work off of that. Yes, yeah, do you want to try that? I'll try that, yeah. Just hold on a sec. Right, I'll take control because I've I've got your presentation up now. Yeah. Can you see your presentation? Uh, I can see half of it on my screen. Hold on, I'll just switch that off. Yep, I've got it. Yeah. Um, uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to be like a government uh, COVID bulletin now. You'll have to let me know when you want to. Yes. Yeah. No. Next, I'll, next slide, I'll please. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so anyway, apologies for the little technical glitch there. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, welding of steel flanges. Obviously, you can bolt two flanges together, but if they are not connected to a pipe either side or a valve, uh, they're not going to do any work. So um, the, if we can have the next slide, please, Richard. There's two examples, uh, little pictures here. So we're, where we're we using flanges, we're not particularly talking about what flanging pipe to pipe. We're talking about flanging uh, for a, 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 a man entry or a, a, an air valve like the top little sketch shows or in the bottom sketch they are talking about a spool piece with a, a washout uh, type arrangement as shown in the bottom picture. Can I have the next slide please? So the, uh, the steel flanges that we're talking about are governed primarily by BSEN 1092 uh, this is a pressure um, designated flange system, unlike the ASME 16.5 uh, uh, flanges. In the water industry, you're looking at uh, 16 bar nominal pressure as, as, a, as, a, as a norm, uh, although the, the standard itself goes all the way up to 400 bar. 
uh, this the, the standard covers a whole range of different types of flanges, but again, uh, principally we're talking about slip on flanges and uh, the standard refers to uh, them by type numbers. So you've got the picture there on the right of type one, which is a plate flange or type 12, which is a hubbed flange. And they're both slip on, as I said, and uh, they can be made. The plate can be flange can be made from plate or it can be forged or it can be a machine from bar, whereas the, the hubbed style flange has to be forged uh, or it can be a machine from bar. Okay. So in terms of materials, we're looking at uh, carbon steels, structural grades, uh, somewhere around the, the range of 235 to 275 uh, yield strength. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this has got a, a number of click sequences in it. So if we can have the first click on that, uh, Richard. So you, you'd, you'd start off with your, um, your, 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 your end pipe. And if you have the next slide, or the next click rather, uh, you clean off uh, the end if you had any coating on it. Um, you'd square up the end, make sure there's no uh, bevel, um, uh, just like a square ended pipe. And then you'd insert the, or, or the pipe into the flange or the flange over the pipe. So if you have the next click, and this little cutaway uh, schematic here is showing you how it, how it might look on the end of the pipe. You can see that the, the pipe doesn't go right up to the flange face. It's actually set back a little bit. And I've, just for simplicity, I've just shown a hubbed flange uh, here. If we have the next click, thank you. So you're welding it on the inside and on the, on the outside. So typically you would tack it on the, on the outside. Um, depending on the size of the pipe, would uh, influence the number of um, tack welds you make. And then you'd weld the outside, weld the inside, use, often with a single pass, and then you'd weld the outside, usually with two or three passes, depending on the size of the, um, of, of, of the fit of the pipe itself. Okay, and then once, once, you've, weld, once you've welded that, uh, you'd inspect it and, uh, and go from there. So this slide here is about weld detail, and uh, there's two ways of measuring the size of the weld. One is measuring the throat thickness, which is what a structural engineer would be interested in. Uh, that's that's what gives you the strength. Uh, and the other the other way is to measure the leg length. In other words, just the the, the 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 distance on the pipe or up onto the flange. And generally, a welder or an inspector would be more interested in that uh, method of measuring the size, uh, simply because it's easier to measure in the field. So if we could have the next slide. So coming on to the welding processes, um, you, typically you've got uh, stick welding or manual metal arc welding as, we, as it's officially called, uh, or you've got um, solid wire gas metal arc welding, or you've got uh, flux cord welding. So there's essentially three methods uh, that, are, that are commonly used. The two photographs in my slide um, are just about uh, stick welding and that's a, a gas for that's for a gas application, uh, but the, the, the principle is very similar. So in terms of position, again, my photograph shows the pipe in horizontal position and it's fixed, so it's not rotated. Um, but if you could if you could put the work piece onto the bench, you you you'd be much simpler to stand the pipe up, and then you're welding around um, around the vertical pipe, which is generally easier. I've talked about the number of passes. So on the inside, typically you'd put one run because uh, it's a smaller fillet weld. And then on the outside, typically you'd use two or three runs, again, depending on the size of the fitting. So if we could have the next slide, please. And then here's just a couple of uh, pictures of another application. Again, it's gas industry. But this one here, you can see the pipe standing vertically. Um, it's tacked in place to give you that gap uh, between the um, the end of the pipe and the, and the face of the flange. And also it's quite important to make sure that you accommodate any gap uh, or annulus gap uh, evenly around, around the circumference. Okay, can I have the next slide please? And then there's just a pretty picture of, what of, of the, the range of sizes that you can look at. So this, this photograph is showing you from one inch up to 12 inch, um, but you could have you know, 48 inch, 56 inch, you know, it really doesn't matter. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? So once you've welded your, your pipe, you want to inspect it. 
so what methods uh, do you use? Well, principally, uh, the first thing you're going to do is do a visual inspection, uh, make sure that the shape is right, make sure the profile is right, make sure there's no lapse or uh, porosity or or any defects like that. I mean, if you if you're getting cracks on your welds, certainly on steel in in, in this day and age, um, yeah, you'd, you'd have a real concern. It should you should be nowhere near that. So uh, what what are you looking for? Um, it's it's mostly mostly shape, um, and then the the other method of uh, inspecting is magnetic particle inspection, and the little photograph there on the right uh, shows uh, an inspector inspecting a, a weld. That's that's actually a um, a pipe spigot weld, but the principle is still the same. You've still got a fillet weld uh, going round uh, on that, and then there there are standards uh, where you can assess the what's allowable and typically in the industry be using ISO 5817 and usually quality level C on that and I think that takes me to my to our last slide Richard so uh, the little photograph on the right there showing you a, a system of crossovers on a twin parallel line and you can see the number of flanges involved there between on the crossover valves and on the inline valves and on the uh, the the, 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 um, the wash out side of things as well. So thank you for listening, everybody. It's a very quick whistle stop tour of, of welding of uh, steel flanges. There's a lot more to it, but um, um, I hope it's just given you a, a quick flavour of, of what's involved. So thank you very much. OK, thanks, Neil. That's a whistle stop tour of the, into the world of um, steel pipes and the manufacture of steel flanges and the, how they're attached. So as I alluded to before in Neil's presentation, there is a there is a subtle difference um, in the way that steel flanges are attached to the way that ductile arm ones, although when they're both made, they look they look the same. So thank you for that. Um, need to come out of this. OK, back to our agenda. And. Back on presentation mode. Right, so the next one before a much needed tea break is going to be a presentation from Phil Green. From Sangaban Pipelines. So you, Phil is head of OK, I'm going to hand over to you, Phil, as um, to give us a presentation on all the things we need to know about ductile alarm pipes. OK, thank you, Richard. Uh, apologies to everybody uh, earlier. I lost the uh, I lost the connection to the team's meeting, so I've been frantically paddling in the background trying to get the reconnection. So uh, hopefully we're back up and running now, so uh, I'll be able to share some uh, hopefully interesting information with you. My name's Phil Green. I'm head of technical at Sangaban Pam. Um, and I have a, a obviously a vested interest in ductile line pipes and ensuring that things are done correctly. Uh, and I'm currently chairman of PSE 10, which is the BSI standards committee that governs iron pipes. So um, we, we have a close involvement in the development and application of ductile iron um, products and development going forward. I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully you can see that now. And I'm going to start the presentation. So a bit of a look, you can see that presentation that's fine yeah. so thank you thank you richard so apologies for the satellite delay so <clears throat> from a from a there we go from a sangaman pam perspective um and we're a bit we're a bit slow I'm, i've had to pair in on my phone so apologies for the uh the pace at which this um Right, OK, so Sangaman flat pan pam flange pipe product. Um, it's in the diameter range 80 to 2000 millimetres. We do pan ranges of PN10 to PN40. Um, they're made to 1092-2 um, uh, and PN16 is the predominant flange rating in the UK. Uh, I think somebody's already mentioned that. So our products are generally PN16. Um, <clears throat> There's, there's two different types of ductile iron flanges. There's an integrally cast flange, which is which is used on valves and fittings, and there's a welded flange, which is used for flange pipe, double and single flange pipes. 
and flange pipes can come in a, ver a variety of lengths, uh, can be socketed short lengths or double spigots. Uh, and we also weld on bosses for those particular flange pipes. So from a UK perspective, it's EN545 for water and EN598 for sewer pipes. And again, to go with our range of flanged products, we're also developing Revit BIM libraries so that in terms of design as well as manufacturing installation, we've got a control over the uh, over the product design and application. <clears throat> so just bear with me while the uh, connection goes forward. So that's a cross section of an, of an inter integrally cast flange. Uh, basically, there's the same joint. It's in compliance with BSEN 545. Uh, it's an integrated flange which is cast as a single piece. So as I mentioned, it's on valves and, um, and fittings. It's got a higher structural strength than a welded ductile iron flange, and that's what sometimes creates difficulty for uh, for sites when they might apply a load to a, a cast flange. They don't, they can't apply the same load to a welded flange. So that's where I guess part of this learning process comes in. Um, and it's more tolerant for site, let's call it variations in installation. However, it's, it's still extremely important that we should follow the correct installation instructions to ensure that fixings aren't overstressed. <clears throat> I guess the more interesting one is the uh, is the is the uh, ductile iron welded flange joint. Now, this is a cross section of a, of a ductile iron welded flange joint, uh, and again, it's compliant to BSEN 545, and it relies upon a combination of factors to provide its designed functional performance. Um, it's uh, there's a weld there's a weld preparation and profile that we need to manage. There's an optimum hub length of the flange, which is in contact with the pipe barrel, that we need to manage. There's a shrink fit tolerance on a on a, um, a welded flange so that it, it's, it shrinks and has an interference fit onto the pipe barrel and not forgetting that it's got to be incorrect. It's got to be correctly installed using the right bolt um, specification, jointing sequence, uh, lubrication and bolt torques. So there's a, there's a combination of factors that, that, uh, that go to making a successful welded flange joint. Now <clears throat> it's made to BSEN 545. Um, and there's a number of factors that are prevalent in that uh, in that particular process. Uh, just bear with me while the next slide comes through. Yeah, so there are there are sort of four main factors that uh, that we have to consider. Um, ductile, as, as as we looked earlier, um, we saw the steel flanges. Ductile iron flanges are not steel flanges, so the parameters applied uh, to steel are very different to the ones that are applied to ductile iron. So uh, EN545 type test combines uh, a number of factors that must be applied to the flange joint um, <clears throat> to demonstrate the performance of the system. And then type tests need to be carried out to ensure that you demonstrate the performance across all diameters. So a type test comprises of, uh, of a pressure of 1.5 times the, uh, the PN rating of the flange plus five bar, a bending moment that would be applied to the joint. So for example, if it was a DM300 pipe, you would apply a 26 kilonewton meter bending moment to that, uh, that to that particular joint. Um, a defined test assembly. Uh, I think Phil just touched on this earlier. There's a there's a test assembly that we have to work to, and there's a time scale of two hours where the load and pressure should be consistently applied. So they're the parameters that that we apply to ensure that ductile iron flange joints meet uh, and exceed the requirements of the N545. And once all these have performed, uh, have achieved these parameters, then they're approved for production. <clears throat> so looking in a bit more detail about um, ductile iron flange joints. Well, they're rigid and they're self anchoring, and I think various speakers have already spoken about this. Um, they're type tested and certified to EN545. They're designed to withstand pressure thrusts, axial pressure thrusts. Um, but the bending moment is limited by the ceiling capacity of the joint and the bolts and the gasket and by the material strength. So it's really important that people recognise that these aren't designed to, to bend and twist. They are um, rigid self anchoring, but they're straight line thrusts. Um, <clears throat> as, as again mentioned earlier, they're predominantly designed for above ground parameters. So the bending moment above ground must be controlled to safe limits. I've sort of highlighted the point here that flange pipes should not be buried, however. Practically speaking, we know that they are. So where they are buried, we must uh, we must insert or include uh, flexible joints located near to the flange joints um, to 
to ensure that there's uh, any um, any 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 movement in the ground is is mitigated through the rocker pipes. So again, it's really important to uh, to ensure that we've got the correct design parameters around ductile iron flanges. Um, and again, touching on what Phil Clisson was speaking about earlier, care should be taken when jointing ductile flanges to other materials, so it's particularly flexible pipes, um, so that we don't transfer the strains of those pipes to the ductile iron flange. <clears throat> if we look in a bit more detail about the uh, about the joint itself, the gaskets for potable water are EPDM rubber. Uh, they're Naltral rubber for sewerage. There's a 80 international rubber hardness degrees gasket, uh, and the properties of those gaskets are in, in accordance with BSEN 681-1. Um, we recommend, Sangaban recommend, the use of steel grade bolts, uh, steel bolts grade 4.6. We also recommend that these bolts, nuts and washers are um, lubricated when the uh, when the joints are when the joints are installed. We also recommend that we use a um, the recommended torque and a calibrated wrench. Uh, and I will say with my tongue in cheek, we don't mean a scaffold pole, but sometimes we have seen that happen on site. So it's really important that we understand what we should be doing on site and how we should install things correctly. I think later on you're going to see some examples of how that can be managed and, uh, and controlled effectively on site. And also we have to ensure that we uh, we, we, um, we tighten the joint, uh, tighten the bolts in the correct sequence. So that's sort of an overview of the of the flange joints and and the sort of I guess the design parameters that have to be understood. <clears throat> but it's useful to understand then what the what the manufacturing process is for ductile iron welded flanges. So I'll just do a very simplistic I guess whistle stop tour through the manufacturing process of ductile iron flanges. First thing we do is we we, we cut the full length pipe. Um, we cut pipe from the barrel of, of standard pipes, so you've got a centrifugally spun pipe. We cut that barrel down and then the proposed welding area was shot, blasted and cleaned to give a clean hub uh, and welding contact area because it's really important that the, uh, the, the, the interface is clean uh, and well prepared. What we then do, we, uh, we measure the outside diameter of the pipe of the barrel where, where, the, where the flange pipe is going to be made. Uh, and the reason we do this is so that we can then bore out the, the flange that we're going to be welding onto that pipe. Um, and we bore out that, uh, that flange with an interference fit onto the pipe barrel. And basically what this enables us to do is to facilitate a heat shrink uh, a process on the, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the flange so that when it sits on the outside of the pipe, it heat shrinks back onto the pipe with an interference fit. After we've machined the pipes, um, as I mentioned, we'll we'll uh, we'll heat we'll we'll heat them up and then we'll shrink them onto the barrel. Um, so basically, what happens when we put the barrel onto the pipe? Uh, sorry, when, when we put the flange onto the barrel of the pipe, it cools down and tends to shrink. That's where you get that interference fit on the hub onto the spigot end of the pipe uh, to give you a, 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 an interference fit along the hub length on the barrel. Once that's uh, once that's put into place uh, and the and the and the heat shrink is complete, we've got a, we've then got um, a welding process we apply. It's an automated welding process uh, with controlled speed and weave, um, and it's based upon design, uh, defined welding parameters um, for a specific size. So we know from, from a Sangaban perspective, we know what uh, what process to apply, we know what speeds and weaves to apply depending on the size of the pipe. So again, all these are based upon type test parameters and audited um, audited parameters. Once the flange has been welded on, um, there, there may be some, uh, there may be some, um, uh, I guess, lack of alignment in that in that flange when it's welded on. So what we do after that, we will um, uh, machine the raised faces. So we have squareness and flatness of those of those raised faces, so that when we join that flange onto a fitting or another pipe or a valve or whatever it might be, we know that we've machined those faces square, so you're getting that that that, that flat square um, face on the raised face. <coughs> And after we've done all of that, after we've done all the, ma the manufacturing process and the machining of a raised face, we will then um, hydrostatically test it. So every pipe that's manufactured is hydrostatically tested as part of the factory production controls process to ensure that the pipe and the weld is leak tight. So again, there's a number of steps that we take to, to try and ensure that the, we've got a, manuf a manufacturing control on there. <clears throat> so as I say, every pipe is, uh, is pressure tested in the plant. We then send that to a finishing line. Uh, and we we apply the, uh, the or repair the top coat of that pipe, be it blue or red, depending on the parameter. And we, we repair the cement lining to that pipe again, depending upon what the function is. We'll put the put the put the correct repair on, on the inside of the pipe, and it's able to then be labelled and ready for dispatch. Uh, 
So that's the part that we can control from a Sangaban and from a manufacturer's perspective, and if, if indeed any manufacturer's perspective, they're the elements that we can control and we've got we've got um, parameters of quality control that govern that. Um, it's then when we deliver it to site. So when we deliver pipes to site, that's when it becomes really important to understand what the installation parameters are. So um, there's, a, there's a set of parameters there. I'm not going to read all those parameters on the screen, but, but you, you'll get copies of these slides, so it's interesting to go through that in, in, in detail. But in summary, basically flanges should be clean, have the correct nuts, bolts and washers uh, and gaskets. Um, nuts, bolts and washers should be lubricated uh, and the correct installation should be followed. Uh, and as you can see on the diagrams there, you'll, do op you'll, you'll, you'll tend to put the bolts in on opposites um, and then you should ensure that the correct torque is applied using a calibrated torque wrench to ensure they've got uniform loading on these flanges. If you follow all those, um, if you follow all those uh, installation principles, you will get a good joint, you will, you will, you will get the correct uh, installation sequence uh, and we've got um, details of this installation practice in documents that can be downloaded from our website. So again, this is a summary to indicate our, our governance in terms of installation, but you can download this from the website to, to keep it in your back pocket when you're on site. When you install, it's also very important, <coughs> excuse me, to ensure that you apply the right torque. Um, to, to bolts um, and I, mean, I, I did mention briefly earlier that uh, probably slightly tongue in cheek that sometimes um, bolts are over torqued um, and not necessarily measured and sometimes we'll, we'll have conversations with sites to say there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question around a particular joint we'll ask them what the bolt torque was and we often get an answer that I'm not quite sure so again it's a this is part of I guess a learning process for us all really. How can we make it clear what those parameters need to be and how can we ensure that we, we train those out to sites and we can get validated data to say that's been done. And again, I think later in the pro in the presentations we'll see some of that, how we can control that on site. So in simple terms, uh, there's, a, there's a table there of, of bolt torques required for flanges for ductile iron pipe. These are our recommendations. Now, these have all been um, defined and established through research and development, testing and measurement. So from a Sangaban ductile line perspective, we've got confidence in these. We know that they work and this is what our recommendations are. But to summarise, you have to ensure you're using the right gasket. You have to ensure that using the right hardness gasket, using the right, the right grey bolts, you've lubricated the bolts, nuts and washers, and you're using a calibrated wrench to achieve the correct uh, and recommended torque uh, and using it in the tight sequence. So again, um, that's what we recommend that, that you do for, for jointing. Now, where you might join ductile and flanges to other materials, there are other bolts out there, there are other recommendations out there, and would certainly recommend that you speak to people to understand what their recommendations might be for jointing to different materials. And I think Craig's going to speak later about different options for bolting and flanges out there. So it's definitely worth taking advice on that to ensure that you're following, um, uh, I guess you're following agreed and, and known parameters for installation. So <clears throat> in terms of a summary, uh, ductile iron is an established and proven material for flange pipe systems. But to maximise the benefit of iron joints, you've got to recognise the differences between cast and welded flanges. It's good to validate the type test performance of ductile iron welded flange joints. Um, again, it's to understand the application and control the potential for site bending. Um, avoid burying welded flange pipe. Uh, again, we've, we've mentioned this before in previous presentations where you can't well, you can't avoid it. Uh, use rocker pipes to mitigate any potential for ground movement or settlement. And I think DeBanker and Phil have both touched on this. Um, we'd recommend that you, if there is going to be ground movement, you don't try to resist that through bolting everything up really tightly. You put um, you put uh, actions in place to mitigate that so that the joint that the joints and the ground can move rather than try and resist the movement. Um, use specified gaskets, bolts, washers, joint sets. In certain, insert and tighten bolts in the correct sequence and recheck and record the torque. It, again, from a, from a manufacturer supplier's perspective, it's really important to emphasize that, that we record the torque so that we know if things are not quite working right on site, we've got an understanding of what happened and what the uh, what the parameters were. So that's, that's, um, that's basically my slides in summary. So uh, uh, thanks for listening. I hope it's been useful information for everybody. Um, and if there are further areas of inf uh, uh, discussion or questions, please please write them down. 
please uh, contact us directly. But I'm, I'm hoping this, this stimulates a, a discussion around uh, around joints. And I'd certainly encourage everybody to talk to us early in the design process so we can design out and mitigate issues to enable successful applications. So, uh, so thank you. Well, thank you, Phil. Um, fascinating insight inside the factory, so to speak, um, into how ductile iron pipelines, flange pipelines are manufactured, which I think it is absolutely essential for everyone in this industry to understand how things are manufactured and understand what standards they're manufactured to. Um, and if in any doubt, as I think other speakers have said, I mean, I've, I've always found talking to the manufacturers to be hugely valuable, uh, particularly if you were expecting a, a product such as a flange pipe to do more than the standard. Um, if you wanted, for example, if you're connecting a ductile iron flange pipe to a polyethylene pipe, forces there are potentially more than the standard. So it's important to understand the limitations of, of products and, and possibly um, communication is the key into getting a product that actually will suit the needs of, of, of the project. So yeah, absolutely fascinating. We're, we're roughly two thirds of the way through our journey now on, on to, in the world of flange pipes. We've covered design and all the things that a designer needs to know. We've covered manufacturer. The two are very closely uh, related and uh, communication between those two parties is, is, is absolutely vital. Um, we, um, we're going to have a much needed tea break now. Um, where we can have a bit of, bit, bit of 20 minutes of downtime just to let all that all that uh, be absorbed. Um, afterwards, we're going to cover the world of you know, assembly. And as some of the speakers have already touched on, flanges are very reliant on the bolts that hold them together. And uh, that has to be done with the right materials, the right uh, bolt materials, bolt diameters, the right torques and the right gaskets. And that's potentially something that hasn't always been well understood in the industry. Um, it's possibly been a forgotten subject to a certain speed, and it, and it gets forgotten at, at um, everyone's peril, really, because particularly in the world of bolts, ringing them up tightly with brute force is not the answer. It doesn't work. So um, after uh, the break, um, you're going to find out why when um, with uh, Craig's presentation on flange gaskets and bolts. So I'll see you all. At, uh, hopefully at um, 10 to 4. OK, welcome back everybody um, to the second uh, part of our flanges uh, workshop. Um, hopefully you're finding this uh, um, an interesting and informative experience and um, I can't actually see the comments at the moment for some reason on my screen, but hopefully they are all being recorded uh, so that we can move on to those after the, uh, the next two presentations. So the next one uh, we're going to have, um, and it's a slightly longer presentation than the previous ones, uh, because there is quite a lot to get through. Um, so this is uh, Craig Edwards has kindly agreed to do a presentation on uh, nuts, bolts and gaskets and the importance of the correct selection uh, in uh, completing uh, your flange joints. So at this point, I'll hand you over to Craig to take over with uh, gaskets and bolting. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard, and uh, good afternoon all. Uh, thanks very much for your uh, time today. Hopefully you can now see my presentation and find my company logo on screen. Um, you'll notice the gaskets and bolts, which is what justifies it. So let me give you a little bit of history about William Johnson for us to kick off with. Uh, we've been about since the 1940s. Uh, we currently manufacture about five and a half million uh, RAS approved EPDM gaskets a year, uh, fed into the UK water industries via uh, many distributors up and down the UK. And we complement that with um, many, many thousands of bolts uh, to form gasket and bolt sets. Uh, we conceived that idea some 30 years ago, believe it or not, in conjunction with Scottish water. Uh, where there was considerable cost savings for actually supplying them as a kit as opposed to supplying them separately. Uh, we are now the leading gasket and bolt supplier to the UK water and gas utility sectors, but I suppose one of the things that separates us is, is that we offer technical support to all our customers. 
So I'll give you a little bit more history and maybe a little bit of evolution as to how I perceive that we have uh, reached the stage that we're at today with uh, flange connections. So back in 1972, uh, I was five years old at the time, that gives you a clue. Uh, my company, in conjunction with um, another company called Gates Rubber uh, down in Dumfries, uh, conceived the uh, Rasaproof EPDM that is currently used. Why did we use it or why, did we, why was it conceived? Because asbestos um, was the alternative and it had got a bit of a bad name at the time. So asbestos on its way out, we needed an alternative. And uh, that, that same RAS approved EPDM uh, material uh, really saw its, its birth back in 1972 when we were using uh, ductile uh, flat face flanges um, as opposed to the raised face variety we see now. So it was a relatively easy transition out with asbestos, in with RAS approved EPDM, but we were still at that point using um, Imperial nuts and bolts, oiled nuts and bolts, uh, may add, to prevent corrosion. And that oil also acted potentially as the lubricant for the nut and bolt assembly, and something that we've missed out on for a large number of years. Um, just to, to cap off also on polyethylene pipe, it also saw its uh, entry into the UK back in the 1970s um, and is currently governed by the BSEN 12201 standard. Ductile flanges back in the 70s were all BS10 Imperial standards and we referenced them as tables D through to J. Um, but as the metric system evolved, uh, I suppose 1989 saw so the exception of BS4504 and the reciprocal standard for bolts is BS4865. And that's now evolved to 1092 with the reciprocal standard for bolts being BN1514-1. But notice that during this uh, transition period, we gained that raised face. And what did that mean from a gasketing perspective? So if you look in the centre of that um, slide, you'll see that the uh, large grey uh, flange, I suppose, depicted the imperial flange, with an awful lot more surface area than we currently do. So inherently, if we reduce the surface area, we need more squeeze on the gasket to affect the seal. So that, that, that's one of the things that's quite an important change to note. Also note that the disharmony between BSEN 12201 as a standard and 1092 as a standard, they don't match up equally. Uh, there's a difference, the dis disharmony, I suppose, in flange geometry. Um, ideal flange geometry exists when two flanges are identical and that's a luxury unfortunately we are not afforded within the water industry very often and not just on the dimensions but on the material and also on the surface finish the surface finish from a gasketing point of view is also very very important so having looked at the individual standards that govern flange geometry and different materials we now look at that surface finish in a little bit more detail uh, in the picture you can see there, uh, I'm sure it's all too common I've seen uh, for those in the water industry, a particularly shiny blue flange. But if we look at that um, detail within the 1092 standard, you will notice that the surface finish for jointing faces is very much uh, prescriptive. And we deviate away from that by putting a, a, an epoxy coating on there, uh, really supposed to protect for you know, corrosion uh, and also to make sure it's RAS approved. But maybe one of the questions I ask is, you know, the, the gasket itself is RAS approved and providing that function for us. Um, from my perspective, I need that friction um, as described by 1082 to assist in making that uh, strong connection for you. So we've not given ourselves the best chance of creating a tight joint. We have reduced the ceiling surface area. Uh, as we can see, uh, move away from imperial ductile flanges to the raised face flanges we see now, and we've reduced the surface finish. And we almost sit uniquely in that fashion because all other industries have quite a luxury when it's identical flanges that they want to join. Um, the deviations that we experience in the water industry are extensive and therefore, from a gasketing point of view, makes it a little bit more difficult. And if we look at ASME and having identical flanges, there are calculations that we could make uh, to look at you know, safe sealing. Uh, if we employ the strength of the bolts, the surface finish, the gasket stress values, etc., and we can eventually work out by calculation whether we're going to achieve a safe seal or not. Not quite as easy within the water industry for various reasons, and some of those are detailed here. The fact that we use rubber gaskets, and uh, I think Phil touched on the uh, shore hardness of rubber earlier on at 80 shore. But you know, the, the maintenance and yield values that are used for calculation of um, these installation torque values do not deviate between 40 shore and 80 shore. 
as a maintenance and yield value. So potentially quite inaccurate to be able to, to do that with a rubber gasket. The surface finish is already detailed and the mating of flanges uh, with dissimilar hardness or dissimilar geometry. So too many variables to account for and invest within a, a standard, unfortunately. And as you can see, and, and as you probably know, there are a tremendous amount of um, different connection times that we make. Um, we use steel and ductile flanges that deviate from 1092-1. We use polyethylene flanges, obviously, to 12201. Stainless steel flanges are the absolute only flanges in the water industry that conform to the 1092 standard in terms of surface finish. Uh, we also you have flange adapters out there, so there's further decay away from that 1092 standard in terms of surface finish and in terms of the width of the um, ceiling face and also in the thickness of the flange. Um, so an awful lot of deviation. How do we begin to address that uh, complex problem? So if we knew specifically the right gasket type that would uh, assist in the mating of the, this multitude of dissimilar flanges, that would be part of the way to solving our, our problem on leakage. But we also need to ensure that these gasket types are installed correctly. And bad installation practices exist at a high level within water utilities. Uh, the questions that I get asked and have been asked over the years uh, and the, the things that I witnessed on site with people using scaffolding poles, JCBs, as uh, my good friend from Scottish Water will, will detail and back me up on, and all sorts of different ways that uh, people will, will try to force a seal. And, and that forcing of the seal ends up with a gasket that is over tightened. If you think about it, there's only three ways that we can install a gasket. It's either going to be uh, not tight enough, in which case it leaks before it you know, gets the hydrostatic test. It's going to be over tight, in which case it probably will pass a hydrostatic test. But by over tight, over compressed, it will lead to long term failure. Uh, and that's an issue that we really need to address and, and are addressing. Um, along with the next speaker, uh, Wes Little from Control Point, we look at um, how to properly install a gasket, how we validate that installation as well, so that we have a, an ongoing record. Um, but I'm not going to steal these thunder anymore. Um, this little table here, this, this uh, target you can see, looks at some of the um, interconnected. Um, issues that you have between gaskets, flanges and fasteners and some of the deviations away from achieving a seal. But the, the concept is that all of these things should work in harmony and should all work within their safe limits. And if we can achieve that, then we're part of the way to um, affecting a strong seal. Correct bolt grade is essential to ensure appropriate compression and that is dependent on the gasket type and the application um, and appropriate lubrication attached on earlier on deviation from uh, lubricating the load bearing parts of the bolt uh, and the assembly uh, sees a massive reduction in applied load, somewhere between 50 to 70 percent. So the guys are working hard to try and do a job, but because they're not applying lubricant to the, uh, the nut and bolt assembly, they are basically doomed to failure uh, with it. With a wide variety of possible flange combinations that are varying geometry and strengths, is it logical to think that one gasket type can seal them all? And that's the one that we do 5.5 million over a year. Um, how do we make it work? We have to force a seal from it. It has to be over compressed in some instances to do that for us. So there's obviously got to be something better. I'll touch on that shortly. It's also logical to think that without training and ongoing competence management and data validation, that anyone can make a tight flange connection, particularly when we know that the flange connections are of a complex nature in the water industry. So unfortunate fact that the necessary skills uh, are not there for guys to install uh, with accuracy and confidence. Uh, the diversity of connection types, gasket types, faster strength, lack of appropriate installation technique and many other things contribute to um, poor installation and increased leakage. So to create leak free connections, two things are essential. The correct gasket type and bolt grade based on the flange types being connected and the correct installation methodology. So touching on this one next, we will look at different um, flange materials conversant with the 1092 and 12201 standard. There are gasket types that lend themselves in a more appropriate fashion to creating a longer lasting tighter seal. And if I look at that top one there, I'm using two metal flanges and I'm not deviating between uh, ductile or steel or in fact stainless. I'm just going to call them metal flanges. As long as they have 1092 geometry and a raised face, then an aram fibre gasket and an 8.8 grade bolt will achieve a tighter seal, a longer lasting seal than a rubber gasket. If I drop down one and look at polyethylene with a raised face, then 
we've got a different, uh, two, two major uh, issues at play there. One is we're, we're working cross standard, we're working between 12201 and 1092, so the flange geometry is not great, but we're also working at different hardness of materials, so we need to compensate for that. And that gasket type you see in there is known as a steel rubber gasket or SRG, that's approved APDM. Uh, from 50 mil to 2 meter normal bore in PN6, 10, 16, 25, and 40. Um, it is a rubber gasket, but it offers a higher degree of integrity than a standard brass approved EPDM gasket. I can make that slide available to you later. I don't propose to go through the entire slide at this stage, but there are also other gasket types as, as detailed that look at dielectric issues and how we compensate or how we negate hydrocarbon ingress. This little slide here uh, looks at torque load and compression versus bolt stretch on the preload and the rubber gasket. And if I bring out a little bolt here, we can see that it's got a maximum load that the bolt can take before it's yield. Uh, after it begins to yield, it's in that plastic zone. Eventually, if we continue to tighten, tighten it, it ends up in failure um, of a fracture moment. And if we then look at where the rubber gasket sits down there, that 45 degree angle being part of the, the, the preload of the bolt, then we can see that there's certainly enough strength in the 4.6 grade bolt to uh, achieve a seal on a rubber gasket. So the standard cry in the water industry is to log it up, the tighter the better. But because we know rubber, because we know gaskets, we know that we can over compress rubber um, and fight them very, very easily. Um, it was a, a certain lovely company called Sangle Bain that did the calculation a number of years ago to prove the amount of strength available in a 4.6 grade bolt was in fact 4.7 times as much as required to uh, compress the rubber gasket itself. So, too, uh, not, not tight enough, I uh, should say too tight and uh, simply won't work. There's got to be a better way. And what is that better way? Well, what we're going to do is train the guy, we select appropriate gaskets and He's not Batman, that BAT stands for Best Available Techniques. The installation methodology that Control Point have um, is laced with international um, approval. So HSE, BP, the European Sealing Association, Fluid Sealing Association, most offshore companies, pharmaceutical companies, all follow Best Available Techniques. Um, and that looks at the installation methodology, including uh, circular control check passes uh, and lubrication, of course. Now, where do we introduce that level of um, torque? Where does it sit? Well, we can't over compress the rubber gasket. We must have preload. So somewhere in this zone here uh, is, is where we're looking for it. And part of that can be done uh, by looking at the gasket stress, but part of it can also be done by testing. Uh, and sometimes that is the most accurate way forward. So to look at, again at the different gasket types, if it was RAS approved EPDM on polyethylene to polyethylene, polyethylene shows quite a, a degree of creepage uh, and most of that within the first 24 hour period post installation. So uh, a circular control check pass is for, uh, formed at the end of an installation, but it should also be repeated, in my opinion, one hour after the installation and within a 24 hour period after it. If we want to negate that um, creep relaxation, the steel rubber gasket is excellent at compensating for it. Uh, and control point, and we'll have done various testing with it as well. When they go back the next day, they don't have to tighten back up. The relaxation has been compensated for by the steel rubber gasket. So it, it, it's got a place where we are joining polyethylene to uh, steel, where we're joining polyethylene or steel, in fact, to uh, flange adapters. If I look at the graph there, the 4.6 grade bolt and the rubber gasket, and I draw a little line along it, where the maximum uh, load that the gasket can take before it goes into what's known as compression set, that is where it will not recover or when it's existing in a state of crystallinity. Uh, it's lost its elasticity, in other words, we have, we have killed the rubber gasket. Um, we don't achieve that uh, without overloading the, 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 the bolt uh, massively, um, and you know. I suppose when we look at the installation torque values that are available for it, um, but it's easily done because there is enough strength in the 4.6 grade bolt to do it. Um, and it always mystifies me when people start to use 8.8 .8 grade bolts with rubber gaskets. So looking at an atomous fibre gasket, there is not enough strength in a 4.6 grade bolt to load 
the hardened fibre gasket to give it the compression that it requires to make and maintain a seal. Um, and that similar sort of graph there, you can see uh, the material that I'm looking at is an orange coloured material, will in fact seal up to 80 bar. Uh, quite easily. Um, the material is strong, it's well, well within its safety limits to, to seal on uh, steel flanges, ductile flanges, etc. Uh, and, and calculations have been done because we have known geometry, um, we don't have much deviation away from the um, 1092 standard. We can then perform what's known as ASME PCC-1 calculations to give us the installation torque value that we know is going to work best with it. So validated if you like at that point. That's laid there is just a little summary um, of what we were looking at previously. So 4.6 again, bolts have sufficient uh, strength to over compress a rubber gasket, so we need to control torque. Uh, note that the 8.8 gear bolt does not achieve preload until after the rubber gasket is over compressed, so do not use them with rubber gaskets. And note that both rubber gaskets and arm and fibre gaskets can over compress if we don't treat them with respect, and in fact treat them with a digitally controlled uh, torque wrench to make sure that we're doing the job correctly. The second item we require to create leak free connections is appropriate installation and ongoing validation. So, as I mentioned earlier, I worked closely with Control Point and WES over the past couple of years uh, to ensure that their EUSR approved flange connection training um, is uh, you know, up with global uh, best available techniques and that addresses the common installation issues that create flange fears. Uh, that's what sort we've of touched on today. So, Control Point will give a little talk shortly on that, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll enjoy WES's chat. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, for that. It was a absolutely fascinating um, 20 minutes on, on flanges of uh, gaskets and uh, the range of options out there is staggering, frankly, and so certainly I think it's probably a little understood at the moment. Um, and probably most people just, just go for EPDM gaskets and then leave it at that. And obviously it, it's a vast subject and certainly one you need to be a little bit familiar with, um, particularly when mixing materials by the sound of it. Yes, um, so there are there are solutions for everything. You just need to know what to ask for, I suppose. So hopefully yeah. that's given everyone an insight into how important gaskets and bolt, correct bolts and, and mate talks are really, and how the futility of over talking to solve a problem. OK, so that that concludes that and um, leads quite nicely on to the to the um, to the last presentation, which is it's uh, it's all very well knowing all these things, um, but how do you how do you know they've been done? Um, and verification has become a, a sort of increasingly important topic, really, particularly um, if you do as I do get involved with a lot of failures. It's important to know why something's failed, and having the having good data is essential um, to knowing if there's an underlying problem. And um, the next talk by Wes Little. Uh, from control point is going to show how we can use new technology, uh, we can use new digital tools, etc., to to uh, record uh, and help, or basically help with the installation in 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 helping with sequencing and bolt tightening, and also provide that permanent record of what's been done uh, for quality control purposes. So, with that, I would like to hand over to Wes if you could take control. Uh, yeah, sure. I will yeah. turn my camera on yeah. to save a bit of bandwidth, but let's see if this works. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yes, yes. Sound. So <clears throat> with all of these things, I've, I've kind of got the, I won't say graveyard uh, shift because obviously there's a bit to talk about. But in terms of control point for the last decade, we've specialised in eliminating leaks from the utility sector and really what I'm going to talk to you about over the next 10 minutes is how we believe we can do this now for flange applications. So we want to eliminate leaks on pipes and we want to do that through the following methodology. So we believe the route to success for a right first time approach is education plus technology plus data. And that's essentially how we believe through working with the likes of William Johnston, working with a couple of people that are on the call. So I'll give a few people a shout out, Dan Jefferson, Willie Langan, etc., that we've really taken it upon ourselves to develop a methodology that allows us to make sure that all the previous speakers how have talked about how it's all been manufactured how it's meant to be installed the things you meant to do that it doesn't fall down at the final hurdle based on behaviors or often what is a lack of knowledge within the sector 
There are a variety of methods that people use in order to tighten up flanges. Regrettably, and most often, the big boy in the middle is the one that most people will reach for first, and that is a beautiful impact gun. That will nip up a flange in no time at all. The problem is most impact guns don't have the precision element that allows you to be able to control the amount of torque that you're putting in. If you've been to site and you've seen an engineer use a hydraulic or you've seen them use a pneumatic or a, a handheld battery drill, you'll notice they'll buzz the bolts up, possibly not in any kind of order. They might go just round as how they think it should be done. And then they'll go back round with a torque wrench. If that torque wrench clicks before they've even moved it a few degrees, I can guarantee you that that torque is too high for that bolt set because there are no controls over it in the more available. There are products available, um, but they are quite expensive in relative terms. We often see people, especially in the water sector, on smaller diameters, so tier one, anything below 180, the most common tool you find in their van is, a, is an adjustable spanner. An adjustable spanner is okay for use at home, but it is not okay for ensuring that that pipeline is gonna last 200 years. And then the others are varying forms of spanners that we talk through on our EUSR training course to explain to people that it always starts with the right materials, the right equipment and the right knowledge. And there are many situations that we want to address or bring to people's knowledge where unfortunately due to the design of certain infrastructure, valves in particular, there hasn't been much consideration given to how the individual is meant to get a ratchet plus a adapter into that uh, position to be able to do them up, nor can you alternate the bolts. And as I think, as uh, Craig's already said, the load should be applied from the nut side rather than from the bolt side in order to be able to ensure that you're applying the right kind of load. <clears throat> and as we've seen, um, as Richard was saying, there's a number of torque wrenches available, but the key is the word on the bottom. These are all precision devices. Now, there's nothing new around torque wrenches. They've been around for a long period of time, and a torque wrench is definitely better than a scaffolding pole attached to an open-ended spanner. But often these torque wrenches that are on our vans are not calibrated. A torque wrench can be bought quite easily for about 30 to 40 pound, and it'll cost you 50 pound to recalibrate it. And often they're never calibrated. Digital torque wrenches have been around for a while and digital and Bluetooth are effectively the same, except it's much easier to steal data or harvest data from uh, Bluetooth. There's nothing particularly new about Bluetooth products. Um, it's how we've been able to develop our systems for use on the electrofusion side and on the butt fusion side. So what we're looking to do is utilize the Bluetooth technology that's within torque wrenches in order to be able to capture evidence but also, more importantly, it's just not about the data. The data is only one aspect of it. What we're trying to do is make sure that we guide people through the assembly process so that if you are Scottish Water, Welsh Water or uh, Jane Bentleys and you want people to do it a certain way, that the app will guide them how to do it correctly so that you know that there's consistency. Craig's probably covered this and so has many other people, <clears throat> but when we do the EUSR training, most people don't start by numbering their bolts, nor do they know that the easiest way to do up a flange face in accordance of if you're going to do it manually by hand is to do it 30% of the total torque value, 60%, then 100%, and then you go around clockwise. So bolts are meant to be tightened up diametrically rather than just in any random order. And when we're teaching people who have been doing this for 30, 35 years, you can always see a light bulb moment when they remember that time when they've tightened it up and they found one loose bolt when they've gone back around with a torque wrench. It is so easy to miss one or two bolts on an eight stage flange, maybe less so, but you are fumbling beneath for bolt number two. On a much bigger flange, 20 bolt, 24 bolt, etc. It's very easy to miss a nut or miss a connection. In terms of the statement at the bottom, that's the key bit that we always tell people. Whatever you are trying to keep inside that pipe is trying to get out and it will take every opportunity available to it in order to escape. And what we're trying to show to engineers, managers, designers, apprentices, that there's a balance, a harmonization of forces and loads together that prevent those joints from failing when they're in use. 
But there's a key piece here that we always go back to. And that is the application of torque. So friction is a good thing in some ways, because as we turn the nut onto the bolt, it becomes tighter and begins to compress, as we've said earlier, the gasket, and it only compresses it by a few percentage of its actual total thickness. But unfortunately, we can achieve the torque, but not the tension. And that is because most of the friction is built up between the nut, the bolt, the washers, the threads. So you can lose up to 50% of your torque or clamp value if you do not lubricate your nuts and bolts. And there are many organisations that didn't realise this, but once you've given the lubrication to somebody and shown them how easy it is to actually put it on and then watch them assemble it, it is amazing to see the difference it makes just from a assembly perspective on how easy it becomes to tighten up a bolt to even 330 Newton metres because the lubrication is overcoming the friction between the face of the nut the nut face against the washer, the washer face against the flange, et cetera, et cetera. There's normally a video on that and I won't show it because it's longer than my 10 minutes, but you can find the link. And essentially what the this American video shows that you can easily use a pneumatic torque gun or a hydraulic torque gun and you can put it on a machine and on this it's a uh, bolt tension in, 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 in foot pounds, a lubricated bolt is well able to meet its requirements of 53,000 uh, foot pounds. A non lubricated bolt or a bolt from out of the back of the van can only get to a third of that total torque level. But as far as the gun's concerned, that is tight because all of the effort is being lost in overcoming the friction of the nut to the thread to the bolt to the washer. And we prove this on our EUSR training. And the EUSR training for us, as Glenda already mentioned, I saw in the comments, it's critical. You can't just assume that people know how to do it. And the likes of, I know Dan Jefferson's on, Bentleys have engaged in a massive scheme of training all of their operatives, managers, supervisors on how to correctly install bolts. This is the wondrous stuff that we recommend you use for the water industry. So this is the Interflon 1200. And um, you don't need to put lots on. You just need to put a little bit on the thread, a little bit on the nut and a little bit on the washer. And that is an amazing uh, change of how well that will give you the ability to give compressive force and achieve the required torque settings. We were asked and there's many guides around how to do this and I've probably done it a disservice because this guide is quite old, but it's about 12 pages long. But effectively, for simple terms, this is how we would imagine a normal talking process to be taking place. So you would clean and examine the, uh, the, 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 the faces, the nuts, the check the flange surfaces for damage. If you're ever on site and you see somebody dragging a flange across the gravel, please stop them because you are already starting to give yourself the opportunity for leak. Once you've aligned the flange faces, you shouldn't be using mini diggers or jacking bars or other things to align them. They should be nicely aligned easily. Then you're onto your gasket and choosing the right type, the right size, the right material. Put it in neatly. Make sure that it's not creased. If a gasket is creased, imagine a sheet of paper. If you took a sheet of A4 and laid it on your desk and slightly bended the two corners, when you let go, it would fall flat. If you crease it and put a line down the centre of it, that gasket is damaged forever. Once you've then lubricated it, the bolt, the, bolt, the nut, the washer, follow the tightening sequence. So that's 30, 60, 100, and then radially until each nut is torqued to 100%. Now, what we find when we do this and we train people how to do it correctly, we'll find, as Craig had said, you don't need to go back 24 hours later because the torque hasn't changed. There's no movement, there's no creep, there's none of the friction relaxing the bolt. We all know that pieces of paper work extremely well in excavations and on site. They stay very dry and it's very easy to find a pen to fill them in. Obviously, that is incorrect, but at least it's a step forward in many clients now trying to record information that is required for you as a contractor to provide to your asset owner. So this example here is just a very simple sheet that would record all of that flange data specifically in order to give you something at the end. Often the torque values are written on in the offices away from the job site and may not reflect what actually happens. It's a well-known fact that 
people who tighten up flanges, especially those that have had them leak, will probably ignore some of the torque value that they're provided and they will put it tight, as tight as they think that it won't leak. But tightening or over tightening will not give you a leak free um, installation. So in order to address that, we had a couple of quite a few companies come to us and ask us to do it. We decided to build a application. So this short video, should it play? It will play, just see. Don't work with videos, let's have a look. Typical. Typical is like that. No. I'll come back to it in a second. No, not going to play ball today. But what it allows us to be able to do is to take um, data from installations. So this is an example here that I'll bring back up and I'll try and see if I can get the video to work from a different set, is the ability to be able to record specific bolt information. Now on this record here, you'll see that you've effectively took me 20 minutes to do this job, to do all those bolts up, and the torque wrench is designed so that it records on each um, setting exactly what torque setting is achieved by the operative, giving you a full evidence of each torque value. That means, as you can see here, if any of those bolts are torqued up in red, then you are able to then eliminate those from risk in terms of you can go back and replace those single joints if you wish to do so in order to um, eliminate a single bolt. So I'm just trying to find it whilst I'm talking to you on here for the other video because the video will show you what we're doing. Okay, so I'll stop sharing a second. And then reshare. So if you can see that, so we've worked with a range of um, Bluetooth um, wrench manufacturers. So this is typically what would happen. You would put the bolts into your flange as normal, make sure they're lubricated, number them, and then get them reasonably hand tight before you start thinking about talking them up. Now at this stage, most people would probably go around with a buzz gun, as I've said before, and then potentially with a torque wrench. But we've built an app that allows you to be able to buy operator, log in and set your unique references. You can QR code scan each job. You can determine whether you want a single mode or a multi-mode pass. You can set the number of bolts. You can take photographic evidence. Once you've then paired the app to that mobile phone, it will talk you through the process from start to finish and will show you categorically what torque value that you've been able to achieve. Now, it talks you through, it lets you take photographs at the end. It's, it's a new app, but actually we've been developing it for the past three years in um, unison with a number of our key customers. It records what qualification the individual have got that's doing the physical install. It will give you the GPS location, the date, the time of it. But more importantly, it will give you evidence of the flange, how many bolts were done, what order they were done. It asks questions of each operative in order to determine whether or not they've done it in the correct order. And we really think that this is probably going to be the way that we now see um, people doing flanges. So I'm now onto my last slide, just to reshare, apologies. So realistically, what we're looking for is for you all to be superheroes. Everybody who's joined this, all 250 people, have the ability to eliminate leaks on their networks. And it's through creating this awareness and providing you with the evidence that we hope that we can allow you to be able to stop leaks forever on your network. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Wes. Um, certainly interesting thing about um, impact drivers, because I, I've got one. In my quest to buy every power tool known to man, I did get an impact driver, but I find it a most uncontrollable beast, actually, and uh, certainly not something to be used where precise bolt tightening is 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 to be is to be used. And, and so. it often, often as I say, uh, Richard, it's a challenge. You know, when we go to site now and we and we show them the use of the various Bluetooth torque wrenches we've got, that um, 
sometimes you can't even get a torque wrench in and the only way to tighten the nut up is to either do it by hand with two spanners or to use an adapter on an impact gun that allows you to angle the impact gun and do it up from from the side so it, it is a challenge and it's one of the things that i think we need to push back against some of the supply chain to, to make sure that when they say torque up a flange to 330 newton meters you can physically get a tool in to do it and that's not always the case unfortunately yeah exactly and um no uh, you know a cautionary note for designers really uh, make sure you allow enough room for for bolts to be a adequately tightened and, and not shoehorn pipe work into too small a space. Okay, so um, that brings us to the end of, of our presentations. Hopefully it's given you a pretty good journey through the, the process of, of, of installing flange pipe work, successfully installing flange pipe work without leaks, without failures, but also some insight as to how vast a subject it is and, and how much you need to know really to be aware of all these issues so you can avoid them. So um, before we go on to a, to a summary um, of the event, um, now's the time for people that have been patiently waiting to put their questions and, and, and hopefully get answers. Um, so um, I can't, for some reason I can't see the question box myself, but hopefully Sean can because um, at this point Sean is going to take over um, and um, manage the uh, the questions process and let's see if we can get a lively discussion going really um, on, on these presentations. So over to you Sean. Thanks Richard. I was worried at one point, I think we were an hour and a quarter in before we had a single question thinking I'm going to be making up some uh, a lot of questions myself at the end but we've got the opposite problem now. Um, David Michael was the first one in with what safety factor is allowable bending moments on ductile iron and steel flange? Probably one for Phil, maybe Neil um, regarding steel. Phil do you want to come in first if you're still there? If not, do any of the other Sorry, guys. No, I was I was just trying to get yeah. the just trying to get the technology working again. Um, well, the the, the the bending moment is built into the um, the type testing parameters that we uh, that we that we that we, that we talked about in my um, in my presentation. So um, that's that's basically what you're seeing in that type test is the uh, is the performance characteristic of the of the product. And, and there was a follow up question as well on that is what is the finishing pipe prep for the ductile iron flange? Finishing pipe prep? Well, we either shot blast uh, the outside of the pipe or we linish, um, which is basically a, a very fine, a very fine grinding process. Um, so basically what we do there and why we do that is to take off all the external coating on the pipe because these pipes are they have a zinc aluminium alloy. Uh, on the outside plus a finishing layer. So what we have to do is, is, is get down to the base metal on the outside of the pipe so that none of that um, zinc aluminium alloy interferes with the welding process. So it's basically a, it's either a shot, bass, a shot blast or fine linish, um, which, is a, which is a fine grinding process. And when we after we've done that, that's the point at which we take the dimensional detail for the outside of the pipe so that we then machine the bore of the flange to suit that, uh, that finished, that linished, uh, that linished surface. No problem. Do appreciate it. we've got 100, 200 people on the line, so I'm just going to try and read the questions out rather than go to individual people. If we don't answer them exactly as you want, then please put another comment in at the end and we'll try and get back to you. Um, next one was from Rob Williams. Do you recommend bolt torques provided for sealing pressures? Do, do the recommended bolt torques provided for sealing pressures allow for the theoretical bending moment? Um, yeah. oh. Yes. Well, sorry, I jumped in a bit there, Sean. I do apologise. <laughs> That's all right. That's the quick question. We've got a lot of, a lot of quick <laughs> answer. We've got a lot of questions. So we'll, uh, yeah. we'll push on. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. In simple, simple answer, that is yes. Because that's again, that's part of the type testing process and the and the stresses we impose on that. So those bolt talks are through that test and uh, proving process. Chris Hewitt asked, is there a table showing typical torque values for joining PE to ductile iron pipe? Who, who, want, who on the panel wants to jump in on that one? I could give you a small answer on that one if you want. I think it depends on the gasket style used. Um, we have some for EPDM and we also have some for steel rubber, but we must caveat that installation torque value with the inherent strength of the polyethylene stuff and backing ring. Um, and also paying a little bit of close attention to the uh, geometrical differences between the two flanges. We're happy to contact me directly at some point and I'll go through it all with you. Cheers. 
probably another one for you, maybe, maybe it was as well. Um, Brian Hunter was asking, during installation, when rechecking and recording talks, is there a defined period of time you need to leave between rechecking? If so, does this vary between different pipe materials used? So again, depending on different gasket types used, um, steel rubber gaskets um, compensate very, very well for stress relaxation within the bolt and within the flange. EPDM gaskets, not so much. So my recommendation with an EPDM gasket is to do a circular control check pass um, one hour after the uh, last one, and then again 24 hours uh, after. Um, if we use an aramid fibre gasket on steel to steel, then there's no need to go back and retorque. If you use a rubber gasket, then follow the same uh, methodology, one hour and 24 hours after. Thank you very much. Where's anything to add? Is that yeah, I mean, what we do find when people do the staged assembly, and I think Craig will attest to this, is it, there's very little movement, um, even 24 hours later, once they've used the effectively four stage pass, the use of the lubrication and set the correct torque values, that there's very limited um, need. And I think this could become quite critical for the networks where you might be backfilling that joint within the next two to three hours. So I think having the confidence that if you've done it and recorded it, that you should be good to bury it and not go back and check it 24 hours later should be good. I don't know if Craig's got any other points on that. No, as I say, it's stress relaxation within the flange, the boat and the gasket are always something to be aware of. So again, even just running a little test yourself, uh, you know, follow Wes's installation methodology, it's best available techniques, and then check for stress relaxation. If you don't witness it in that specific type of assembly, using specific components, you're not going to see it in others. If you do witness it, take remedial action. Okay. Martin Foles was asking, we keep hearing that uh, flanges are for above ground applications. Rather than that being the narrative, can we have clear guidance as to what should be done to make them suitable for, for, for below ground, um, as that is what they are and what they are continually used for? Um, that's quite an open-ended one. Possibly one, did, did Banker or Phil, do you want to come in on that? or Nick even? Yeah, I think it's a fair point. So I think there should be um, some guidance, and because I mean, Sangaban, to be fair, in it do do offer guidance on on you know and and offer some basic details. But um, I think it could certainly be expanded upon. It's like many things in the water industry that there's very little guidance out there, and we we've not done well. Unlike the gas industry, which keeps its guidance in in good order, the water industry hasn't done so. Yes, yeah, some good guidance documents would be useful, and um, it, it, it's keep the stresses below what what the type test stresses would be is is the key. I think that's the key. What we're trying more to about do. engineering practice, isn't it? The mm. good engineering practice about. Yeah, uh, I, I was so thinking I, that I the, must have missed this one. Yeah, the messages I'm getting is, is that um, you should allow provide rocker pipes next to the flanges so that uh, the pipe is allowed to flex or you provide a reinforced concrete slab under the pipe work so that it so that it can't move so you either prevent it moving or you allow it to move um, but avoid the stresses going onto the flange itself yeah and i think uh, one common example is uh, we find steel pipes with uh, buried valves and then uh, there might be an argument that steel pipe is flexible, so do we really need to have uh, rocker pipes either side of the steel pipe, or or can the pipe uh, flange that assembly be buried? Because if if the flanged pipe is buried, whatever bending stresses are generated will transfer to the flange. Uh, it, it it depends on how much is the stress. If the pipe is rated for 16 bar and it is running at 15 bar then probably this is not worth taking a chance. You're better off providing. So there has to be a, an engineering judgment. It's not really a straight answer that you can not do this thing or can do that thing. Do you it, might agree with that on diameter, it might depend on diameter as well. And, um, correct, correct. It's it's small, a, small diameter pipes, you, you probably get yeah, away with it, um, but, but large uh, diameter, no. Yeah. But this is why I think it is very important also to understand that softer materials generate a lot less stress. If you, if you, the, the, having a P pipe flexing in ground is probably a lot less problematic than having a steel pipe because 
is just the stresses will be much higher. So I think it's it's some maths need to be done before a decision on this is taken. It's not a straight answer. Thanks, Dipanka. Um, next one, Sangaban Pam flange pipe bolt torque guidance. Is this joined up thinking from pipe and gasket supplier? Um, where's Phil? You both want to comment on that? Not where's Craig, Craig and Phil possibly? Well, I'll, I'll start if that's okay, Phil. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is basically through research, uh, research and development and testing. Now, this, 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 this group, this, uh, this discussion forum has been a really good uh, opportunity to, to sense check this with with uh, with others, um, particularly uh, particularly Craig, and we're in, a, we're in a dialogue now with Craig to sort of go through that and understand that to, to ensure that we're not uh, we're not at cross purposes. So we have a, a shared understanding um, and and potentially get to the point of of, of having shared um, you know shared shared advice. We're not there yet, um, but we're certainly in dialogue with, uh, with 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 gasket and bolt supplies to ensure that we're consistent in our uh, our approach. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Phil and I, I think we'll carry that, that chat forward uh, and, and validate, obviously, installation torque values pertinent to the, the, the gasket type and the application. Um, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that the installation torque values that Sanger Bain have got work great potentially on ducktail to ducktail, but we've got other combinations in there as well. So I, I think that's probably worth the validation um, as a lot of these, uh, you know, flange types um, have moved on potentially since the uh, original validation was done. Cheers. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I just sorry, to, sorry to just reinforce that point from Craig's perspective. It is really important for us as a ductile iron supplier to understand the impact of, uh, of stresses imposed by other materials and the recommendations for selecting the correct joint sets for other materials. So we certainly, we'll we'll take that conversation forward. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chris Hewitt was asking, does anybody have any info on torque values for 18-inch um, table D cast iron flanges? I think the critical word in that is cast iron. Well, we've not touched on that subject today. Um, Craig, I think I'll possibly start with you and then Phil, you're probably the next one down I'd start thinking about in terms of cast iron. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, can you just give me that question again? My, my uh, voice was um, probably most Anybody up. got torque values for a 450mm uh, 18-inch table D cast iron flanges? I'm um, probably not one to talk about now, but possibly they got in touch with either you or Phil, I think, in the future. Yeah, yeah, but by all means, both Phil and I would be happy to, to, to take that one forward. Uh, not a problem at all. Yes, um, I'm sure we've got some data somewhere that we can dig out. Oh, Phil even. I, I think contact details for all the panellists that yeah. spoke today will be on the, the end of, or the start of the slide. Chipping in, Sean. Thank yeah, you. I, I am to know that Sangaban have got one, but I haven't got it to hand. Cheers. Um, Martin Ruiz asked, um, it has been said that the joints in a PE patch with flanges to other materials require special consideration. What are the recommendations for the design of stub flanges buried when they are needed, i.e. joining a PE to a buried ductile iron valve? Who wants to grab that one? I, I can grab that one. I mean, it, it's talk to the stub flange manufacturer and, and the gaskets people like Craig and, and make sure all, all three are correct. Where, where you've got to be a little bit careful is, again, if, if you're pushing 16 bar systems up towards 16 bars and operational pressure and um, you've got some complex arrangements, you've got to appreciate the polyethylene puts loads into some of the ductile iron flanges that are above and beyond um, what they would be if they were tied to another ductile iron fitting. So you just got to be careful when you're at the outer edges that the, the PE can overload the ductile iron fittings. Um, so th th there's, a, there's a few things to be careful of there and th there's a separate committee rewriting a Syria report at the minute which will hopefully give some guidance on this. And I think a few of them chaps are even on the call today. Even the audience are. is um, fairly widespread today so uh... Not just the speakers. Um, next question from Dave Mitchell again. Um, is there a rule of thumb for torque wrench access space for different pipe diameter bigger bolts um, need longer torque wrenches? Um, yep. Yeah. Nick? Uh, on, Nick. Yeah, there's a very good rule. It, it's called the rule of hips. It's not a rule of thumb. <laughs> so for the, for the purposes of safe entry and egress, there should always be enough room for an adult be able to get their hips and shoulders past the pipe and any excavation supports. 
and that's plenty to get any reasonable size torque wrench in, bearing in mind that the torque wrench can be vertical as well as horizontal. You know, the only caveat to that, Nick, is that your hips and waist are about half the size of mine. So. <laughs> Okay, I would well, say that's, is, that's up to David when he's doing his design to make sure he's complying with the requirements of a competent designer that knows that uh, it's going to be you climbing down in the bottom of that trench with a with a torque wrench in your PPE with your hard hat on. Yeah. Go on, what, 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 what I would say is um, we go to a lot of sites and there's lots of people on this call that have had me out in the recent months and we are finding it is increasingly difficult to have conventionally available torque wrenches that will fit into the gaps that valves often provide. You can't reorientate the bolt, so you can't have it facing the other way because if the torque wrench won't go in, the bolt won't go in. So on lots of valve stacks, there are a number of bolt positions that are inherently difficult to get any kind of torque wrench on. And I think it's one of the areas to, to really review is when you when you're once you've provided people with the training, it's looking at your supply chain and understanding how you're going to physically make that connection and having a bit of a dry run of how it's going to work because you know Craig and I know ourselves there's anything from even you know four inch diameter valve stacks you just can't get a torque wrench in and if you can't load it you're in you in end up tightening from the bolt side don't you Craig that's it's, it's a challenge and then you're not giving the right load. Uh, that's very difficult. Absolutely, Wes. And, and and there's a following up question coming in in a few minutes, I think, Sean, from Andrew at High Talk, who will uh, you will hopefully clarify where, where the torque wrench goes and where the spanner goes. Yeah, and I think I think that was covered. I think it was Rez or Craig covered that in the thing in terms of you, you tighten the nut rather than the bolt. And we, are, we always see this situation where actually you can't get the bolt on the back of the flange to pull it back from the chamber wall. Um, We've all run into that one in the past, and it's a classic. Um, always keep your flanges set back from your walls or your chambers. Um, I don't think there was a definitive answer to the question there, but I think certainly years of experience in terms of we've all run into them where we can't get them there, and let's not go there again. And uh, that's why we find it helps to you know to, to to number the bolts. It's an amazing little step for people who've been doing it for donkey's years. That even if you don't number them one, two, three, four, five, six to twenty, even just numbering them one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then tightening all the bolt ones, all the bolt two, all the bolt threes, it really does help. And that's why our app is more focused on quality control for flanges than just any old bolt say on a trailer etc you know we really want to address making sure that these process steps are done on a tablet or on a, on a, on a phone where we know that the information is going to be recorded in real time cheers the one referring back to the bending moment um what is the allowable moment on a flange in the pipe bridge? Is it lower or if so, by how much? I think this is referring to the Sangaran um, literature as, as the classic uh, pipe bridge and two or three ducts uh, line. Yeah, back to that. yeah well, we've got, I've got, I've not got it to hand, but I've got, we've got literature and recommendations in the literature. So it's possibly easier yeah. if I send an extract of the data from the, uh, from the design guides, if that's okay with, with David, um, I can yeah. send that on to him or send it to the, send to the guild for circulation. Uh, yeah, I'll, if David drops, yeah. yeah, if David drops you an email after this and um, perfect, yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, Andrew Grabowski, what considerations are taken? What considerations are taken in regards to vibrational loosening, cyclic or over of bolts, and junker effect loosening, especially with bolt stresses changes due to bending, as described earlier? What is the general thoughts about the use of backup spanners? At the opposite side of the top process, in many industries, they are banned for safety and joint integrity reasons. Let's take that as two hits. What about the vibration loosening? Any comments, discussions on that in terms of talk? I'll, I'll chip in. Uh, it's nothing to do with the utilities because generally there isn't that much vibration that takes place. But I am doing this work at the moment with a, a pharmaceutical organisation and they are, you know, very wary of the fact that vibration from pumps cutting in and shutting down causes significant different loadings on pipe work and pipe flanges and pipe supports. So it needs to be taken into account and that's where the competent designer comes in, ensuring that they know what it is, what they're doing. It's the Rumsfeldism, isn't it? Isn't it? It's, uh, it's the conscious consciousness and if you don't know, then ask. 
I, I, I just add something to this one, Nick. Um, cyclic load or vibration induced movements. Generally, a buried pipe is lots. I think it's safer because ground is a good damper. So the chances of a pipe under a flange being exposed to vibration induced cyclic load in a buried system is quite low. Uh, I think we are sort of blessed in the water sector because this thing doesn't happen that much. We, we uh, it's probably more relevant for pump houses or places where um, it is exposed. Um, so, any comments about ducts or iron pipes in pumping stations, flanged, um, vibration? I've never seen it being an issue in terms of loosening. I just didn't know of it. So. Oh. Again, for, again, if I could just from a from a Sangaban pan perspective, again, we've never it's it's never been brought to our attention that it's a problem. I'm not saying it isn't a problem in other areas, but certainly from the applications the way we provide our product, uh, water pumping station treatment works, etc. We've not been it's not been flagged as a particular issue. Now, again, it may be something uh, transfer loads between different pipe materials. Perhaps that needs to be considered a little bit more because. Some pipes are flexible, some pipes are rigid. So yeah. it's perhaps a it's perhaps a, it's perhaps an interesting point to to, to uh, do a little I, bit more research on. Absolutely, I I can quote. Um, so the, generally, for pump houses or pumping systems, uh, we we tend to have some flexible joints which take a lot, like bellows, which isolate a lot of vibration. Uh, but I did have an experience of GRE, a glass reinforced epoxy pipe failing uh, in close proximity to pump pumps. Flange failure, it's just, it, it, uh, that's a cyclic load failure. It does happen, but um, quite rare. Uh, I, I do think though that if a flange is subject to a bending moment caused by cyclic loading from a pump kicking in and out, then over years, that strain and stress on the on the flange yeah. could could lead to a failure yeah but it's, it is rare i must say but it, it can happen I, I do know instances where flanges have failed and that's why as a result of fatigue mm. yeah if you isolate yeah. out vibration from rotary equipment we tend to use uh, bellows a similar type of joints which take some shock i think what andrew's referring to is very much related to process plant above ground and the flanges tend then not to cat fail catastrophically, but as a simple leak. Uh, and quite often then the designer will have used different washers. Okay. I've only come across it once, and that was a treatment plant in the Isle of Man, and we got rid of the vibration. It, it was um, just a harmonic thing, and we, we managed to get rid of the vibration to, to solve the problems. But it was a bit extreme, and that's the only time I've seen it in 29 years in the water industry. The second half of the question was about uh, backspanners. Any comments on that? Probably Wes here or? Um, yeah, a lot of people when they're putting the backspanners on don't know that you've got to get the backspanner to be locked off first before you start applying the, the load through the, through, the, through the nut. But I think one of the things that we see with the backspanners is, is people just understanding what is a suitable backspanner. I wouldn't recommend the use of an adjustable spanner, but sometimes that's all the guys have got. And I think there needs to be some form of amnesty where those guys that have got a 25 year old torque wrench kicking around in the back of the van know that it has or hasn't been serviced, that they release the spring every time they use it. And, you know, and that's really where it all starts. It's the equipment, the environment, the materials that can be let down if they don't have the right tools. Yeah, there is a product known as a finger saver, uh, which can be used to make sure guys don't uh, injure themselves critically uh, while performing that application. Not a bad thing from a health and safety point of view to get guys to use them. Um, Wes, you and I can have a blend about that later on. I'll show you what they look like. doesn't do any harm to show the guys out there as part of a, an installation, the safe uh, practice for doing these things. Last question coming up then. Um, what gaskets for DN200 PN16 steel pipe onto a table leaf flange? Um, I think the, the, that's probably the easiest question so far. I think basically just ring Craig up. And, and okay, yeah, I suppose that's one for me. So looking at table E, if I remember rightly, 200 PSI kind of rating on there. So around about 12 point something bar. Um, obviously moving across standard. 
So an examination of the flange geometry, what's available bolt dimensions for it, how much gasket stretch that can we actually develop based on the available bolt loading, what pressure we're up against. Um, my temptation would probably be to move towards an expanded PTFE gasket, offer them a bit of higher integrity, still RAS approved if you need it, uh, and calculations available based on both flange geometries, but make contact with me after and we can go through it. Brilliant. Back to you, Richard. OK, thanks, Sean. Um, interesting questions. Um, one or two um, people interested in in um, in further events um, for like this. And um, certainly the, 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 the reason why we, we started this is because um, there's so much knowledge that is needed for successful um, pipeline construction and implement, implementation. And, and then none of this stuff is available, particularly in, in textbooks. It's not, as far as I know, taught in universities. It's not, there isn't any formal training around. Um, so the only way to learn, well, that's why I'm, by mistakes, that's a good way to learn, but it's, um, it's not very um, cost effective, really. And learning from other people's mistakes is a lot better, but it's equally not very good for the industry. So training events like this are a good way to learn uh, without making those mistakes. And I think forewarned is forearmed with a lot of these problems. And just knowing that it's a potential issue is enough for people to think about it and, and, and take the necessary avoidance. So. I hope it's been interesting. We, we've, we've certainly got a good section of presenters here from, from the whole process, um, but we've only really touched on the start really of, of all these of all these issues. So it, I'm getting I'm getting the message that there's quite a bit of interest in in future events. So we, we'd be um, we'd be very pleased to put them on. And it does, you know, it is something that the Guild, you know, is uniquely placed to do really to hold these informal events. To, to pass on all this useful information, which will benefit, frankly, the whole industry and try and reverse this trend of, of increasing failures in new pipelines. Um, something that, you know, when you start to unravel the reasons why, we've unwittingly it, uh, it, it sort of eroded the factors of safety, um, certainly from, from mainly sometimes from cost cutting exercises, sometimes from new standards, new te technologies available. But a lot of the changes, starting perhaps with not putting flange pipe work in chambers um, and carrying on with, with the, with the uh, invention of the raised face flange and, and new types of coasting, coatings, these have all eroded um, the sort of inbuilt factors of safety that used to exist. So might have gone some way to explaining why we've got an increasing occurrence of failures in the industry. Because one thing that it hasn't changed is the unrelenting ability of water under pressure to escape. And that role of phys physics there is, is always going to be there and it will always find any weaknesses in, in our work. So um, I put up, hopefully you can see the screen again. I, I, these were a few ideas that I had just to stimulate the idea, you know, what we could do um, for future events. Um, in addition to that, we've had suggestions for uh, for design really, so for flushing, swabbing, pressure testing, perhaps we could have a webinar just on designing for operation and construction to help designers with the, in, in, the, in the first stage. Um, but there are other issues affecting the reliability of new pipe work and, and old and one is thrust restraint understanding thrusts we sort of touched on extraordinary thrusts when joining pipes of different materials how that can be a problem um, but there's a lot more underneath the surface of that uh, we've also looked at coatings maybe there's more to it than than just 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 taking the standard um, flange faces was one that um, that Wes touched on and, and um, you know the use of uh, shiny coatings oh, and actually what you really want um, is, a, is a sort of matte surface for, for gaskets to adhere to and uh, I think someone before mentioned a gramophone record as being the ideal surface so if you think of the grooves on that you know that that would be the ideal for a gasket we've gone so far away from that at the moment with the shiny coatings um, again eroded on Maybe there's a discussion on that. Maybe there's also a discussion on whether 
flat face or flat race face is best. And uh, it's something I've often wondered and never really had the answer to it, why we went to race face and, and, and why we can't just use flat face. Um, maybe, there, maybe there's a future um, case for, for having a proper discussion on it. And we focused on water this time, but of course, flange pipe work is used throughout industry. Um, and maybe we can include other fluids um, and gases, so natural gas, hydrogen gas, the move to hydrogen gas is going to have an effect. Um, different types of fuels, uh, food substances, you know, what? maybe we could move away from water. So we are in the guild all pipelines, not just water pipelines. An important one is training and accreditation. And I think that's uh, something we've touched on now. The, there are no formal courses for all these things that we've we've discussed. So the only way to learn is by talking to people. So that's where the Guild is particularly useful because it does provide that platform for different people with different uh, knowledges to, to talk freely and uh, exchange good practice. And, and possibly uh, corrosion protection is, is another subject for future workshops. Um, so what we thought, how do we get some feedback um, now? Um, so maybe um, I've numbered all those ideas, one to nine, uh, just to get a straw poll really as to what the interest is on, on these various subjects. Maybe in the textbooks, uh, text boxes, you, you could put, perhaps have three, three guesses maybe, um, what you'd like to see and then we'll just take you know the one the most popular ones and and that can be the basis for future events um, we'll certainly do more on on flanges but there but there are other subjects uh, as well could, could and, the uh, guild send out a survey monkey or something to all the attendees because we'll have our email addresses and just ask for the top three or ask for some topic okay that's a, that's a good idea we can do a survey monkey to all delegates um, and try and, and we're, what we're focused on is, is obviously the most popular subjects first uh, with the next workshops. Yeah, I think the thought while we've still got 100 on the line was an expression mm -hmm. in your mind, drop the number in the right and we'll uh, count them up at the end. Certainly, yeah, because I think once once you dial off, you've probably got 100 emails to catch up on and, and everything else. And um, if you did put numbers in the textbooks now, that, that's, that certainly gives us an, an immediate feedback as to what, what uh, subjects are of interest and something where, where the Guild can help facilitate. And hopefully this is um, for people that are not familiar with the Guild and, uh, and all the work we do, this has uh, um, certainly generated sufficient interest for you to consider joining the Guild um, and then taking an active part in all the events that take place. So I think um, from my point of view, I think we've more or less come to the close now. Um, but before we do close, um, I'm going to hand you over to Norman Howe, um, who would mention subjects, other, other forthcoming events um, that the Guild are holding. So over to you, Norman. Yeah, uh, thanks, Richard. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's it's really good to see so many of our members join our workshop today. And I hope you'll all agree with with me that we've had a really good event. And um, and I uh, would like to thank all our speakers on your behalf for taking the time out of their busy schedules to to provide such thought provoking and interesting presentations today. And I'd also um, like to thank our event organisers, the Guild's uh, Utilities Panel, and in particular Richard Weeks. We're, and we, without their enthusiasm, hard work and, and direction, we, we simply couldn't hold this, this type of event. And we've, we've certainly today had a really comprehensive review of all aspects of flange pipeline joints. Over the, the, the next few weeks, we do have a full programme of presentations and our, our next events are a, a follow up to the, um, the
the Guild Conference, which we held at the beginning of February. And we have a, a series of webinars to enable members to meet our conference sponsors. So on the 23rd of March, we've got Radius Systems and uh, Ambi Blue. On the 30th of March, we've got Westwood Pipelines and the Murphy Group. And then on the 31st of March, we've got Cadence and the Joseph Gallagher Group. We've then got a, a packed programme for April and the, the highlights include uh, Stanley Black and Decker, who are going to talk to us on tool solutions for uh, safe pipeline construction. Then on the 8th of March, we've got Anglian Water and uh, they're going to talk to us on uh, a new um, uh, self lay code for water mains. And then on the 27th, the, the Eastern Branch are hosting a webinar on the development of a certification system for plastic pipe weld inspectors. So really a lot to look forward to. And uh, for further details of all these events and our future programme, then please visit our website, pipeguild.com, or look out for our posts via the email and, and social media. We use um, um, linked, LinkedIn quite, quite a lot to uh, advertise our events. So to conclude, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for attending and supporting the Guild today. And as Richard said, if you're interested in joining, then please uh, feel free to contact me or a member of our HQ staff. Um, again, Richard mentioned, and we do value your feedback uh, on all our events, whether it's good or bad. And I'd like to ask you um, if you would take the time to contact us and let us know what you what you thought of today's event um, <clears throat> we're always uh, happy at hq to speak with our members so you know please feel free to either phone us or or email us so thanks again for for, for attending today and i hope you all have a have a very good evening and i look forward to uh, meeting with you at some point in the future so uh, good, good night, everyone. OK, thanks. Um, thanks, Norman. Um, and just finally, um, a thank you from me, really, to all the speakers today, all the presenters today, because certainly without all this, uh, all this help, you know, this event wouldn't have been possible. Hope everyone's found it interesting. Now we're going to try something a bit different this time, see if it works. So this is um, the end of the uh, recorded formal uh, workshop, but um, for those people who want to stay online and possibly chat to uh, each other or to um, or to any of the presenters, then they'd be welcome to do so. So we're not. I'm not going to shut the platform down right now, but certainly um, for me, thank you very much for attending. Hope you found it interesting, and this will be one of many. Um, I'm sure, judging by the, the interest that we've had on this event, it's really enthused us to, to hold more events, really. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, Catherine, if you could stop recording, that's the end of the, the workshop.